Spiral the dragon is... is... uh... something's not right here. One second. Um... Ah, that's better. New year, new me. Look, there he is right there. Spyro, what up, baby? Spit that fire one time. I told you you had to come back. You've been gone too long. They ready for you. Come down here and holler at me one time, nephew. I'm going to direct you in here. Come on in there, boy. Woo-hoo. I've been waiting for this. When I was 19 years old, I finally watched Goodfellas. You know Goodfellas. Famous mobster movie, award-winning, the sort of movie that your dad says is a classic. But when I saw Goodfellas, I thought it was good, yeah, grand, fine, but unfortunately, I'd simply waited too long to watch it. By the time I got around to Ray Liotta working his way through the criminal underground, navigating this Italian-American family in the inner workings of a mafia in its prime, I felt a bit let down because I'd seen it all before. I'd played the Mafia video game, I'd seen Public Enemies, American Gangster, Gangster Squad, Miller's Crossing, and most importantly, A Bronx Tale. A movie which had done the Goodfellas shtick after Goodfellas released, but I had watched before seeing Goodfellas itself. So my impressions of Goodfellas was that it was just an amalgamation of stuff I'd seen before, even though it obviously wasn't. I didn't get to experience why it was a classic firsthand, and that's a damn shame. Now, what does this have to do with Spyro? Well, unfortunately, the same effect can be said for when I finally played Super Mario 64 well into my teens. If Super Mario 64 is Goodfellas, then Spyro the Dragon is a Bronx Tale. When I finally got my hands on Mario in a 3D space, I thought this is good, yeah, grand, fine, but I'd played it before, played it better in Spyro. Spyro was my first ever mascot platformer, and still I would argue it's the best of that era because it took everything that worked in those past games, tightened up the screws, and blew some fairy dust over the package to make it feel such a full and invigorating experience to play. And no, before you start, I'm not saying that Mario 64 is the, the good fellas of video games. games. To be honest, I find those sort of comparisons counterproductive when we're discussing the history of the medium. But... The allegory still stands. I'm all too aware that I hold Spyro in such a high regard because it was the first of those colourful, clever little games that I played. But it's still a bloody good game. And its sequel is a bloody great game, and Spyro 3 is, well, a bloody fine game. So of course, when the Reignited Trilogy was announced, it was a first day buy for me. Something something, be aware of pre-ordering, something something, Cyberpunk 2077, but still, a first day buy which I rate extremely highly. We'll be walking through each game in the trilogy, but the core focus is to rate each game on its own right whilst examining each of the components which make an effective mascot platformer. If you want my overall opinion, it's very simple. I am a Reignited Trilogy fan. Whilst it's not perfect, I do think it's superior to the original games as a whole package, so therefore, I believe it's a suitable scope to examine the Spyro games through. If you want an analysis which concentrates purely on comparing the OG to the remakes, I've linked a couple below which I've personally enjoyed. Without further ado, let's get into it. <laughs> Now, I understand he's found a magic spell to turn gems into warriors for his cause. I'll take that question. Nasty Nork is a simple creature. Simple? He has been contained in a remote world and is no threat to the Dragon Kingdom. No threat? Besides, he is ugly. Ugly? That does it! <laughs> Looks like I've got some things to do. It's been said before, but it needs to be said again, the framing of Spyro 1 makes next to no sense. Insomniac were clearly inspired by Crash Bandicoot's slightly edgy visual design, and were keen to portray their own platformer as a game for kids to play after they think they've outgrown Super Mario. 
the use of boom mics and a reporter shows a, well, half-assed idea in the form of a news crew interviewing the dragons prior to Gnasty, Nasty, uh, GG's terrible spell. We never learn who is interviewing the dragons, or why, or who they work for, or where they're even from. It's just a cheap way to give the player a reason to collect all the things. If we're speaking plainly, Nasty's reaction to the dragons about mouthing him seems pretty justified. If you walked onto international television and called me ugly and stupid, damn right I'd find a way to exact some revenge. Did the dragons know Nasty has this insane magical power? If they didn't, then clearly Nasty's been a chill wee guy, just minding his own business this whole time and not bothering them. If they did, then why did they rip into him? Seems pretty unprovoked, to be honest. What a bunch of dicks. We all love to mock and tease the shallow storyline of the first game, but it's a testament to how ramshackle Insomniac were back in the day. Don't forget that the original Spyro was made with a team of 19, and I'm including executive producer Mark Cerny of Knack fame in that 19. Remember Knack? Knack, you're no human. Why do you work for them? God, what a work of art. As a character, Spyro's design purposefully gives him a sense of real intelligence. Original concept art shows that Spyro was initially supposed to be the size of a fully grown dragon, but Insomniac had to swallow up a lot of his size because it made the world design feel too clunky, and due to the limitations on the PlayStation at the time, this would have made rendering simply too difficult. Bringing Spyro to a smaller scale helped to define him as a bit of an underdog. He barely comes up to the knees of the older dragons, and when you put him side by side with Nasty Nork, the scale of our big bad is almost overwhelming. The purple of his skin keeps him feeling more pop-like in his style, and easily contrasts against the orange desert sands and green rolling hills that have defined his life for years. But the colour scheme and size aren't what gives Spyro his intelligence, it's two other ways. The first is his voice. He's the first platforming mascot to be given a voice and agency in his story. Earlier characters have spoken, like Banjo, and other games have had voice acting, like Crash Bandicoot, but prior to 1998, no mascot platformer had given a main character an audible voice. And yes, if you're curious, I really like Carlos Alrazaki and praise be to him for giving Spyro his initial flavour, but Tom Kenny was who solidified Spyro as a bit of a punk with an attitude when he took on the mantle in the sequel. So bringing him back for all three games and the reignited trilogy was absolutely the right decision. Looks like I've got some things to do. The second, and I would argue most important thing which makes Spyro appear intelligent in his character design are these things. The eyebrows. Oh yeah, nothing beats a good pair of eyebrows. That might sound like I'm kidding, but I'm not. Eyebrows are the shoes of the face. You can have a perfectly tailored suit in a flattering colour, but if the shoes are all wrong then you might as well be wearing jeggings. As for character design, if you get the eyebrows right, you've got the attitude of a character right. Take Crash Bandicoot. The eyebrows are separate from his body, they almost seem to lift off of his head, adding to the manic, almost insane energy he gives off. Now look at him without eyebrows. The same goes for Spyro. The eyebrows are everything to his character design, not just his royal colours. The cocking of his eyebrows always makes Spyro stand aside as being confident in his abilities, of being wry, of assessing the situation, commonly arching an eyebrow and stating, come and get it then, I know I've got this. Now look at him without the eyebrows. Not great, is it? He doesn't look like he's ready to smoke a sheep, he's looked like he's, well, Actually, he's looked like he's smoked plenty. And this sense of intelligence is so important in each of Spyro's stories. He's ready to jump headfirst into danger. When the dragons are turned to crystal, his first reaction is to act, to become the hero of this story. He doesn't need to be coaxed. In Spyro 2, he gets dropped into somebody else's story and reluctantly agrees to help them. And in Year of the Dragon, well, there we just do Spyro 1 all over again, but we'll get to that later. Thank you for releasing me, Spyro. Free ten dragons in the artisan world, then find the balloonist. He'll transport you to the next world. What about Nasty Nork? I'm going after him. Find dragons first. That's all I can tell you. 
It's worth noting that Spiral 1 holds your hand in its opening few minutes, but if you subscribed and watched my first 10 minutes series because you're an ultimate pal, you'll know that a bit of zealous tutorialising can actually be quite inspiring if done correctly. Spiral was designed with Western audiences in mind. A Western audience is engineered to read things from left to right, so it's often you'll see games set in 3D spaces highlighting important landmarks on the left hand side of the screen when first taking control. As soon as you've rescued your first dragon, Nestor, the player will see that Spyro is specifically positioned on a ledge overlooking the artisan's homeworld. To the right hand side, we see a pathway leading into a clearing which naturally segments that area off to the player. There's probably a whole bunch of new content that way, so we should probably hold off on exploring there for now. However, if we allow our eyeline to be drawn to the left hand side of our screen, which it almost certainly will, we'll see the hedge maze which leads to Dark Hollow, a very short, linear level which will fully tutorialise the game's combat, movement and collectible system. One slight issue, however, is that many of the dragons you rescue will repeat the same pieces of advice to Spyro. If I had a gem for every time a dragon told me, Their metal armor is fireproof, but a charge attack will take care of them. Or, Sparks the dragonfly has been doing a good job protecting you. Make sure to keep him strong by feeding him lots of butterflies. I'd have enough treasure to buy the artisans. The earnest way in which the game explains, repeats and repeats its systems again and again seems to be at war with how intricately the world is designed to teach the player everything they need to know. Take Stone Hill for example, most likely the second level the player will travel to. Whilst you explore, you'll come out into another open arena with a couple of towers. As you enter this grassy field, you'll hear a strange mocking laugh above you. One of the egg thieves has seen you and is roasting you from above because he thinks he's safe. A first time player will feel their hair bristle and think, what was that? That didn't sound nice, I'm gonna toast whoever that was. And as you climb up the one accessible tower in this arena, the dragon you save will point out that maybe you should glide over to a far off ledge. But the player, even a young child player, is already aware that there's probably something worth exploring on the open plains surrounding you. They heard this mocking laugh, they're already looking for a way to get over to it. It's a recurring issue with the first spiral, where the game desperately repeats itself when the designers have already done such an effective job of organically guiding the player to points of interest. As for the artisan's homeworld itself, well it's a huge playground for the player to experiment in. There's absolutely nothing here which can hurt Spiral. We're free to gallivant through the long grass, toast some sheep, and ram through some completely harmless norks who gently jog around and run away from us. It's a great way to make the player feel empowered in the game's opening moments. The original Spiral games always benefited from their low resolution textures, Spiral 1's hub worlds all have a distinct style to them which unites the colour palette and tone of each individual level. In the game's original design, Insomniac focused on three consistent colours in each of these worlds, and while the environments become more detailed in the later sequels, this philosophy of colour stayed the same. Taking the artisans as an example, the three colours we see in the homeworld and popping up in various shades through each level are green, blue and pink for the brickwork. The pink colour is slightly washed out and you can only really see it clearly if you saturate the image. Uh, take a look. And full credit to Toys for Bob because the colour palette has been replicated in the Reignited trilogy just with further detail. It keeps Spiral from blending with the grass and emerald skinned norks, like he did when he was originally designed with green skin instead of purple, and it keeps the bright shining gems looking distinct in the environment. Peacekeepers is another distinct example, almost all of the levels leading off from this hub are set in a desert or canyon of some kind, translating the colours orange, purple and yellow, again we can see this even more clearly if we saturate the images here. 
And again, Toys for Bob have capitalised on colour theory and continued it into the remake. The Reignited trilogy even took this goal of a unified aesthetic for the game one whole step further as well. It's been said before, but it's important to note that the Dragon's Spyro Rescues all have unique designs and personalities. No longer are we getting a palette swapped thanks before buggering off. Now the Dragon's visual looks, at the very least, are specific to each dragon. In the artisan's homeworld, all appear to be, well, artists, holding a paint palette or even in some cases a ridiculous beret. Do you know what the dragonfly following you is doing? Uh... His name is Sparks. He's helping and protecting you. In Peacekeepers, the dragons have a more primitive design. They're almost reminiscent of cavemen, with very little clothing except to cover their massive dragon co- on the whole, these characters are all designed with sharp angles on their face and bodies, incorporating just enough magical unrealism that we might immediately assign a friendly, unthreatening nature to our dragon friends. If we are speaking pure geometry, the dragons could be painted in rectangles and triangles, but the norks could be painted in circles and ovals, presenting them as more doughy and slack-jawed in their curved design. There are areas where the two are meshed, triangles and ovals, like in the fairies and their actually pretty sexy punk curvaceous design. What's going on here? Hey girl, you uh, you busy after this? The game world too continuously looks like it has an almost rubber or plasticky texture to it, and this has continued over the course of all three remakes. The hills look artificially sculpted, as if the dragons have used their massive size and strength to mould the earth like clay. It may sound like a plasticine texture would be a criticism from me, but far from it. It keeps Spyro's world feeling like one big playground, especially here, at the beginning, a fully animated cartoon that we get to feel rather than just watch. However, there's one issue which came with the Reignited trilogy. Whilst the gem's bright, shining design means that they're created to look unique from the environment, I struggled to find that one last gem a lot more in the remake than I did in the originals, simply because of the long wisps of grass they could get lost in. In the original games, the ground had to be a flat block of colour, but in Reignited, the extra detail can wash away the glint of the gems, especially the emerald ones. I know, I know, that might seem like a bit of a nitpick, so let me label a criticism which is a little more all-encompassing. Spiral 1, being a game of its time, is slightly lacking in how its world tells us its story. Where Nasty Nork's army comes from, what are they doing in each of these worlds, just hanging out? In Peacekeepers, they've created cannons and tents and military outfits, so clearly they're able to think and plan, but their purpose as enemies, aside from guys for Spyro to burn, seems kinda lacking and distinct. I'm commenting on this now because Spyro 2 is so clever and purposeful in its level narration. As a result, the original does stick out in how dated its overall game feel is, even with the Reignited Trilogy's beautiful visual cohesion. Alright, so it's Editing Monty here, just wanting to add to this. Um, so it's come to my attention that in the PS1 game manual, uh, it was revealed that the Nasty's army of Norks appeared when he transformed the dragon's treasure into Norks. I beg your f pardon, Insomniac. Aside from the fact that this feels like a major plot point which should have been shown to the player, not told, are you telling me that this guy has the power to turn an entire race of magical creatures to crystal and can turn gems into sentient, somewhat intelligent creatures? This guy. What the hell were the dragons thinking when they mocked him on TV? I'm seriously losing my mind at this, I'm not okay. So do the Norks just die when they transform back into gems? Nasty created life and we just snuffed it out? Are the gems sentient? Is that why they could be turned into Norks? Am I just charging about grabbing living treasure? It's not all dated aesthetic design though. The world building aside, the original Spyro needs to be lauded for taking a leaf out of Crash Bandicoot's design with its lack of HUD. Spyro's health is shown to the player through his companion, Sparks. Our buzzing wee pal changes colour depending on how many hits Spyro has left. From a bright, vibrant gold, to a moderate blue, to a sickly green, and after four hits, he vanishes or just runs away to protect himself. Not only is this an immersive way to present Spyro's HP to the player, but it also creates an emotional link between the player, Spyro, and Sparks. 
Sparks isn't just our health bar, he's also mechanically useful because he's designed to pick up gems when we're nearby, which is particularly useful when we're sniffling through the long grass for a cheeky green gem which is hiding in the undergrowth. Insomniac took Aku Aku's three feathers from Crash and added a further use to Sparks, meaning the player is invested in keeping him around. If a player gets hit too much and Sparks vanishes, there's a true sense of loss around not having him nearby just to help us out. Hunting down the nearby wildlife, particularly the sheep or frogs which populate the worlds, also keeps Spyro's personality in check. He's small, he's young, he's an underdog, but he's also a dragon and a predator, and toasting our prey to give Sparks a health kick means that the player isn't just looking for shiny collectibles, but creatures to munch on as well. It creates this satisfying gameplay loop which navigates the entire trilogy. Spyro's whole aesthetic, be it on the PS1 or the Reignited trilogy, jaunts along with this breezy cheekiness which gives each story its sense of character. But nothing is as iconic with the Spyro trilogy than its soundtrack. Stuart Copeland was the drummer for the police, but for seven-year-old you and me, we couldn't care less about that. All we knew was that he was the guy who gave Spyro the Dragon its voice. See, the beauty of PlayStation using a disc rather than the Nintendo 64's cartridges was that there was simply more bandwidth to play with. You could simulate numerous instruments interacting and bouncing off of each other at once. The Banjo-Kazooie theme, as iconic and fantastic as it is, wasn't able to blend its instruments. It just sounded like sounds overlapping because that's how the music was made. Spyro's individual sounds got to speak to each other, using polyrhythmic figures. Let's take a listen to the first game's opening theme. There's generally a really bassy sense to how each instrument is used, often focused on the bass drum and floor tom in the percussion, an electric bass and electric guitar to give a sense of determination and gravitas to Spyro's movement. But that joviality, that breezy cheekiness we previously discussed, comes through in the higher tones which dominate almost every level score. Each world sounds very different, but also very similar in how they mesh together. You can say the same for the Peacekeepers theme, I'll play a short excerpt here. The Peacekeeper's world is the front line of the Dragon Kingdom. It's where the dragons prepare for war in the likelihood that the kingdom is invaded. The Norks wear these bizarre little military outfits and have cannons and war tents stationed ready to be used, so typically the brass of trumpets and a snare drum are used to signal war. This gives this world its own unique flavour, but the rumbling, moving bass sound are back again. God, this game might very well have some of my favourite bass guitar ever used in the soundtrack. So, with all of that said, and Spyro's aesthetic firmly established, it's time to get on to gameplay. Let's hop on our balloon and head off to the Magic Crafters and Beast Makers worlds. <laughs> the Magic Crafters and Dreamweavers are strange worlds to me. These were obviously places where the dragons explored and studied magic, but they're also a couple of the few worlds in Spiral 1 which have enemies which aren't Norks. Sure, we previously saw shepherds and rams attack us and the artisans, but this makes logistical sense. Dragons will have eaten the rams and sheep in the past, so they'll be at the top of the shepherd's ship list. As for here, well, just take the magic crafters on its own. Where did these druids come from? They don't just seem to see you as a threat, but each other as well. There's a battle of wits going on when Spyro arrives between the Ice Mages and the Wind Mages. We can see them attacking each other at certain points. 
At first, I read this as there being a tenuous alliance between the dragons and the druids, way before Nasty Nork attacked, and now these wizardy weapons are just capitalising off of the disappearance of the dragons. But we're not here to examine the lore of Spyro, this section is all about the game mechanics. Spyro 1 is a masterclass in owning the platforming trifecta of things, things to, to do. do. Combat, that is ramming and burning enemies, movement, racing around, jumping and gliding, and collecting, using our movement and combat abilities to get to places and collect the things. The design of Spyro's enemies are one of the most interesting things about its combat. We've already discussed that it's generally Norks which Spyro has to manage, and their designs vary from level to level, world to world. They wear a variety of costumes and outfits, from matadors in the town square to soldiers in the peacekeepers world. Each environment gives them a unique dress code, giving them a specific set of characteristics, but often they fall into three camps. Projectile throwing enemies, big bastards with clubs, and small enemies which will whack you, often wearing armour. Spyro has two attacks at his disposal, the charge and the fire breath. The charge can't hurt big enemies and the fire breath can't hurt small enemies, so the player needs to read their design and access which attack would work on each enemy. It acts less like a combat system and more like a diet gluten free light puzzle. When faced with a new enemy, you have to juggle these two options, and because the enemies drop gems when they're taken down, you're encouraged to fight and collect every bad guy in a level to earn the maximum amount of loot. It's not necessarily the combat mechanics which make these enemies interesting though, but how they react to Spyro. In the Artisans, the Norks will yelp when they see you, they'll flee, they'll visibly cower and hide from you. In the Peacekeepers, they'll hide in their tents and moon you when you're not looking. In the Magic Crafters, the enemies shake up the formula a little bit, but they still mock and taunt you. The green-robed wizards which raise walls and towers to block your way will literally point and laugh at you if you don't catch them in time. Different animations are available depending on what tool Spyro is using, and which enemy you're using it on. The sheep lose all of their wool and cover themselves up, embarrassed. Ramming into an enemy with a dash attack feels powerful because often enemies will fly away like a pricked balloon. Armoured enemies, even the smaller ones, have a split second resistance before being knocked backwards, made more cohesive by the clanging sound you get when Spyro's horns collide with them. Sometimes the enemies will even cleave through their pals to get to you, like in the Misty Bog where this boar just rages through a Nork and two attack frogs. It's moments like these which help to minimise any sense of enemies just existing for the player to attack. They react and plot and clumsily get in each other's way. They coexist and for the time when Spyro 1 first released, this was new and fresh. And it wasn't the only way Spyro's enemy design differentiated itself. In the likes of Crash Bandicoot and Super Mario 64, an enemy can hurt the player just by brushing up against you. Now allow me to say that whilst these are typical of game design in the past, they are inexcusable in a modern day platformer. If an enemy is going to hurt the player, they should hurt the player. They should ram into you, they should throw a punch, they should shoot you. Just nudging an enemy should never, ever hurt the player. It's cheap, and in a colourful platformer with a focus on wonderment, it's my abject belief that a player should never feel like they're made of glass. In Spyro, an enemy needs to attack you to hurt you. If they don't take a swing, you can nestle right into an enemy if you like, march up to them for a pet. And I know this sounds silly, but it's a majorly overlooked part of how Spyro designed its encounters. This is the first game from the platforming past which required the enemy to really go for you in order to hurt you, and it should be commended for that. As for moment to moment gameplay, we have the dash, the jump, the glide, the flame breath, and one more odd addition. Spyro was given a strange strafing role in the first game, which I'm willing to bet if you haven't played any of these recently, you completely forgot existed until I mentioned it here. It was clearly added with the intention of giving the player an option when navigating through the many projectile enemies in the game, but it's ultimately useless in Spiral 1. Whilst I appreciate Toys for Bob putting this role into all three of the remakes rather than just limiting it just to the first, it was dropped from the series for a reason. 
Spyro is just too fast, and his dash and jump is so versatile and powerful that the player never needs to be on the defensive with the game's enemies. He is always on the offensive because he's a dragon, he's a predator, he's running into battle, guns blazing, but he's a cocky wee numpty who's eager to prove himself. Having a roll strafe goes against that entire combat philosophy. Now, remember, combat is linked intrinsically to movement in that trifecta we discussed. It's likely a player will jump into a Spyro game and almost immediately jam their thumb into the square button. Spyro will likely spend about 75% of the game like this. Horns pointed towards the enemies, because as a character, he's all about speed. This is where the player gets so much micro-satisfaction. From the cartoonish galloping sound underneath Spyro's feet, to the immediate speed the player gets when running around, to the momentum the little dragon gathers, leading to his jumps feeling more and more like a launch off the ground, Spyro is all about speed. By simply connecting three modes of travel, the dash, jump and glide, the player can feel like they're being pretty creative in the moment. You can dash, jump and glide over an enemy from a vantage point above, just to then press square again to dash into a dive on top of an enemy, meaning you can cleave through them before they even have a chance to look up. Spyro has so much freedom with such a limited set of options, and most of this can be attributed to the level design, the game's greatest triumph, but we'll talk level design in the next section. For now, just be aware that the level design of Spyro wouldn't be nearly as impressive as it is if the movement wasn't simple to understand but satisfying to master. In the Reignited trilogy, Spyro feels tight. He turns on a dime. His relationship with gravity is heavy when it needs to be, dive bombing out of the sky or out of dash jumps, and light when the situation calls for it, like with his glide. They even included a neat bit of accessibility by giving him a little clamber if you just don't make a glide, rather than knocking him off the edge to plummet to his doom. The trickiest part of mastering the system is assessing the glide distance. The question, can I glide to there, constantly pops up through all three spiral games, leading to a bit of trial and error in the first half of each title. I'm particularly reminded of my first time playing everyone's favourite level, Treetops, where you're constantly high up, and you can see ledges and islands in the distance, but can't just glide to them from a standstill. Although that's not an issue with the game's moveset, it's in how this level telegraphs distance to the player. The only clue you get that you need to mix and match the speed ramps is Lyle croaking out this nonsense. Leading Spiral for an amazing tour to Treetops, don't just stop at one supercharge. Ah. Like, how is any kid meant to figure this out without a guide? Hell, returning to the game almost 20 years later, I had no idea how to get the Secret Thief or the Final Dragon. I know we all look back on treetops with rose-tinted glasses because of how clever we felt when we finally achieved the complex set of jumps needed to get to the Final Dragon, but it's about time we call this level for what it is. Piss poor puzzle design in an otherwise interesting level. I don't know anybody who didn't lose at least one life trying to just glide to the far off island. Speaking of gliding, Spiral 1 includes five flying levels which challenge the player in a new way. Let's face it, as amazing as Spiral is, I can imagine it wouldn't be as openly lauded if we had a dragon game where our purple little skater boy couldn't fly. These levels are as close as the original Spyro gets to having mini games. You're against the clock here, the only bit of clear-cut tension in the entire game. Spyro has to fly around and collect items by flying through them or breathing fire on them. Chests, trains, hoops, planes, you name it. And the reason why I put a reverb on the word collect there is because these flying levels are the ultimate presentation in the movement collecting symbiosis. You literally need to collect things in order to keep moving. If you don't collect stuff, you don't get to do the really fun flying stuff. This is something Insomniac always understood in these games, on a macro level and a micro level. The flying levels aren't the only twist that Spyro 1 puts on its movement system though. Once we reach the Magic Crafters world, we get introduced to the charging stations and speed ramps, small slopes with strange electronic arrows on them which can speed Spyro right up if he runs. These are a fun way of shaking up traversal, and they don't just exist for single purposes. In the Dark Caves world of Magic Crafters, you can use the station to launch Spyro over to unexplored areas, or bash through invulnerable metal-backed spiders, or hell, even to destroy resistant chests. 
However, and this is one of those areas where the Reignited Trilogy stumbles where the original trilogy ascended, there's something weird about supercharging in the remakes. In the original games, you could just press square on a supercharged platform and Spyro would tank off like you flipped an on switch that immediately set his speed to a certain level. In the Reignited Trilogy, there's this bizarre momentum build-up that's needed, meaning you need to run on the supercharged platform for a few seconds before Spyro can even reach his top speed. It is beyond me why Toys for Bob added this. Perhaps it was because of the motion blur? Which also shouldn't be here. Needing to slowly crank Spyro up through his many gears so that the shock of this new speed wouldn't give a player whiplash. Actually, on that note of needing to use the supercharge to break through some of the stronger chests, it's probably about time to discuss Spyro 1's collectibles, right? As a collectathon, there's a lot of great foundations in the first game, which are later improved tenfold. If you're anything like me, your mind's eye might have just segregated your collecting experience into three standard camps. The chests, the dragons, and the eggs. This would be fair, but it's rare that we talk about how much variety there is in the forms that your exploration takes. Just look at the chests for an immediate example. Your journey will take you to wooden chests, metal chests, chests that need fireworks, spinny chests that you need to breathe fire on, chests where the gem jumps out and you need to leap into the air to catch it, chests that need fireworks to blow up, and chests that need keys hidden in secret areas in a level that you need to get and then bring all the way back. As a collectathon, there are so many little nuances to how you gobble up gems in your journey. Flashing around with your head lowered and crashing into metal and wooden chests are always so satisfying. The fact that it never slowed Spyro down and the gems automatically suck right up his butt after flying through them means that it keeps up the pace and speed which makes traversal so enthralling. On the whole, this keeps the game from getting stagnant. Hell, in treetops, there are two thieves which haven't just stolen eggs, but jewels instead, and seeing the value of the gems bouncing around in the world keeps up that sense of colourful, cartoonish immersion. Rather than going the boring route and concentrating the player's attention on a counter in the corner of the screen. Looking at the thieves, these little suckers are acting as a mini-game in their own right. Chasing them down is tutorialised way, way, way back at the start of the game in the Artisan's world, before you even come across your first one in Stone Hill. The Nork who's running around with the gem sack is much slower than the thieves, but the objective is the same. Catch him and make him give up his goodies. Whenever a player hears that cackling na 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 na, they can't help but engage in a playful game of cat and mouse, or more like dog and cat, I suppose, seeing as the thieves are sprightly little numpties and Spyro's like a dog trying to catch his fleeing prey. The layout of these chases are almost always in one continuous loop, and the trick isn't in the speed, but in outfoxing them, leaping into the air and using your flame breath as an extension of yourself to catch them when they're momentarily slowed. Spyro constantly introduces these micro-objectives into the platforming without needing to break pace, and again, it's all in service of keeping you always moving, heading off to the next fun, shiny thing. The game operates a shallow economy with its collectibles though. Progress is gated off until you've collected enough stuff because the balloonist is a dirty scumbag. He refuses to take Spyro to the next world in the story until he's collected a certain number of things first. In Artisans, it's dragons. In Peacekeepers, it's gems. And in Magic Crafters, it's dragon eggs. This means that there's a symbiotic relationship between movement, combat, and collecting. We need to move and navigate enemies to collect the things, which unlocks more worlds for us to move and navigate enemies to collect the things. All good platformers do this, gating off progress until the player has engaged with the collectathon enough. But the problem here is that the balloonist always asks Spyro to collect an arbitrary number of things. There isn't any rhyme or reason to why we need to unlock 10 dragons or collect 1200 gems. It just seems to be a number this ratbag asshole has pulled out of his ass. Remember this, it's worth comment because we'll come back to it later when we look at the sequels. Wow, I see you've been busy rescuing I will set fire to this balloon if you don't take us up right now! Of course, the most integral of all of the collectibles in the game are the dragons. How can you talk about the Reignited Trilogy without talking about the dragons? I already mentioned that each one has a contextualised design in the form of their costumes, but the camera work has been tweaked as well, to give us close-ups and the like whilst they talk. 
It's still a shame then that there's clearly so much scenery to be chewed in the fabulous aesthetic that a player is begging for more lore information from these guys. The later games provide plenty of story-based information for each world, but in Spiral 1, the dragons just pap you off with a thanks for releasing me, or the game's millionth tutorial on how you can't flame armoured enemies. Just Take Bruno in Beastmakers as the perfect example. Once we land in this horrid, mossy swamp, he's one of the first dragons you find. He tells you... Nasty North is turning our swamp into an electrified chunk heap. <sighs> and it used to be so beautiful. I'm sure it was. He highlights that the swamp was once beautiful, and all of this modernised electricity crap wasn't here before. Great, that's a solid starting point for teaching the player about what this place was used for. But then that's it. At first I thought this was where the dragons learned to tame beasts, but that's not the name of this world. It's beast makers, not beast tamers. So what were they making? Some Frankensteinian monster? Again, this doesn't undermine the joy a player gets when discovering a new dragon, it's just a shame that Spiral 1 didn't get the same level of detail that its sequel did in providing context to what these worlds once looked like. It doesn't mean the world and level design are poor, far from it. Spyro's levels, especially for the time, were some of the most interesting you could get in a platformer. Actually, okay, so it's probably best we hop on over to Dreamweaver's and Nasty's world if we're going to talk about this. Uh, let's look at Spyro's world design and the end of the game. <laughs> Spyro's level design is what makes me prefer his trilogy over Crash Bandicoot's. The focus on freedom which we saw in the traversal system is clearly the key component in Insomniac's level philosophy, and you can see this translated to Ratchet & Clank later in the developer's life. Spyro takes the basic concept that we saw in earlier Super Mario games, World 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 3, and so on, but plants it into a three-dimensional space. Think about it, what's the difference between Mario's World 5, 1 and the Dark Passage level in Spyro's Dreamweaver's world? The three-dimensional space, that's all. But by incorporating these portals and gates into Spyro's hub worlds, it makes exploring the world feel more naturalistic. Scott Rogers of God of War fame claimed that typically level design can be assigned to two camps when we're looking at three-dimensional games, alleys and islands. Alleys create a directed game experience. Players have a goal to reach, and the level is built to help them reach it. Your alley can be narrow to create a sense of claustrophobia and tension, or it can be wider to give the feeling of sprawl and space. Think Crash Bandicoot's thin pathways with pits and boxes and enemies. You can't leap off to the left or right and explore the level outside of the path. Island design offers expansive space that allows players the freedom to choose the order in which they want to experience the gameplay. Think Super Mario 64's design. You can go off the beaten path, nab collectibles in any order you wish. Now, your typical game doesn't have levels which are exclusively alley levels or island levels. Think of Batman Arkham Asylum if you want an example of this. The level design when you're in the asylum is often alley-like, but once you get out into the grounds, the level design is island-like, leaping from watchtower to watchtower, exploring the full breadth of the asylum's outskirts. Spyro is primarily island level design, literally in the case of worlds like Lofty Castle. In fact, describing it as island level design would actually be kind of doing it a disservice. As a whole, Insomniac have carved out a world design which is islands inside of islands. If Crash Bandicoot is like one long rectangle, Spyro is more like a blob, sprawling out to distant islands, secret underground bunkers and paths which take Spyro up above the level. You can often see the return home sign at the beginning of each world, and understand that it's your job to navigate your way up and over to it. Because the glide can be so versatile, you can manoeuvre to hard to reach ledges with just a flap of your wings. The further into the game you get, the more labyrinthian these short worlds can appear. I mean, you can tank through some of these levels in just a few seconds. Stone Hill and Dark Hollow are a perfect example. Following the intended path, you can clear these in a maximum of 10 seconds. But to do so would be in missing the point. Spyro's main pathway is always plain and straightforward at the beginning of the game. The joy is in the exploration. 
in finding new secrets. And once again, your progress in these levels is hinged on what collectibles you find. Unlocking a dragon also unlocks a checkpoint where Spyro will respawn if he dies. If I was a lesser man, I'd make a comparison between the dragons and bonfires in Dark Souls, but I'm not a lesser man, so I'm not going to do that. Despite being so detailed, especially in its remake, Spyro's levels never feel cluttered. With his head down, Spyro can commonly dash and leap around endlessly without crashing into random paraphernalia. If you do crash, it's either into the walls of the world or a ledge which Spyro can just climb up in order to find a new perspective. Spyro is defined by his verticality. The focus is often on getting up nice and high and then gliding down to secret tunnels, coves or ledges where a dragon awaits. In Mario 64, you often had to think up. In Spyro, you need to think up, up, and away. Unfortunately, the one place where the level design falls flat is when it needs to be the most interesting. Completing the Dreamweavers and collecting 50 dragons means the Balloonist will finally take us to Nasty's world. Hey, didn't I already free you? You're in Nasty's world now, Spyro. And you are the dragon that must defeat him. Bring him on. I'm ready. Reach the exit in each of Nasty's lands, then you can challenge the Nork himself. Four imposing monoliths appear before us, impressive and villainous in their design due to how monstrously mechanical they look. Rather than providing us with choice, the game takes that away from the player for the first time, demanding you play two Nork-heavy worlds in order to unlock Nasty's boss fight. As impressively bad guy as this whole setup is, the inconsistency in the world's aesthetic needs to be highlighted once more. Why has Nasty built his portals inside man-made dragon heads made of metal? I would have imagined they'd be Nork heads instead, which at least would give the player a glimpse into his character, painting him as arrogant and egotistical. But again, the presentation of the world looks cool, but is lacking in narrative value. And worst of all, the two Nork levels are the most alley-like of the whole game. The open spaces are gone, the emphasis on gliding is over, now focused on a narrow pathway which the player needs to follow. I appreciate the industrialised coat of paint these levels are given, but it feels like level design ripped out of another game altogether, without many options or secrets like we saw previously in the likes of treetops or even Dark Passage. Which reminds me, I probably should have talked about this earlier but I'm going to raise it now, is Dark Passage a portal to hell? Like, I'm not kidding, look at this level. We follow dank, gloomy caves burrowing underground and dodging the attacks of devils and hellhounds. What are you supposed to be? I get that the idea of the Dreamweavers are that fairies and dragons have unlocked the ability to bring their dreams to life, but yeesh, what demented dragon dreamt up these things? That was quite a ride, Spyro. You learned a lot since you were a young glider. Oh yeah, probably Jed. I've held off talking about Spyro 1's boss fights until now because to truly understand everything that's wrong with Nasty's battle, we need to look at those which came before it. As a conclusion to such a creative, engaging experience, Nasty's boss doesn't just fall flat, it's squashed under a Nork's club. But let's count down his predecessors. Toasty's first. A sheep who's mad as hell that you've been turning his pals into butterflies and he's not going to take it anymore, gosh darn it. Getting to Toasty is harder than the actual boss itself. These shepherds are totally fine, but their dogs, oh my god, the dogs, man. The dogs are the only enemy in the whole game which need two hits to take down, and I still can't fathom why. They're just too fast, and when they're in the middle of the air, their squash attacks can't be interrupted. These guys are the real boss, and on the whole, this level provides a bit of a challenge, not because of Toasty himself, this guy on his own is as threatening as a washing machine, but because he litters each of his three arenas with bloodthirsty Scooby-Doo's. Next up is Dr. Shemp. This guy is just Papu Papu if someone chucked him in a microwave. His front is armoured up and his back is exposed, so you need to run up to him, jump over his staff and torch his back. Rinse and repeat three times. Somehow this guy is easier than the game's tutorial boss. Third is Blowhard. This time we need to follow this boss through a whole level whilst also navigating smaller enemies. This guy is more of a nuisance than anything else. He doesn't run too far, he just runs up to a checkpoint and waits for you so you can take as long as you like navigating his minions and the obstacles. Three puffs of smoke and he's out for the count. Yawn. 
Fourth is Metal Mouth. There's at least a twist with this boss. You don't need to attack him directly, instead he's a monkey inside of a giant robot. He fires lasers at you from afar, but his shell is invulnerable. The trick here is to destroy all of the nodes before they turn red or else they'll shock you. It's different, at least, focusing on your spatial awareness rather than a battle strategy. Six sheeps out of ten. The penultimate boss is Jacques. He is the only boss in the entire game who attacks you while you chase him, and for this reason, he stands head and shoulders above the rest of them. It means that your focus needs to be both on the environment, jumping over ledges and gaps, as well as the boss himself. In any other game, Jacques would make an effective tutorial boss. It's just a shame that he's saved until so late here. Unfortunately, the same can't be said for Nasty Nork's boss fight. He's not the worst boss in the game, but considering our journey has built him up so consistently, with the dragons we save bigging up Spyro's prowess and potential to take down the smelly green ogre, any player would surely expect something more from this. I get what Insomniac were going for when they originally designed the fight. Spyro isn't a beat-em-up, so he should be suited to a fast-paced race through Nasty's vault. But it just doesn't work. Nasty doesn't even steal from the low yet gradual climb in difficulty we've seen in the other bosses. We saw Jacques attack us while we chased him, yet Nasty does no such thing. He just jaunts off in a hearty jog. This is about as challenging as an egg thief chase, and equally as annoying. Oh, oh, and good, we have to catch two of these pesky critters just to get access to Nasty. Oh, and double good, if we trip off one of the ledges while chasing our big bad, we have to catch one of the egg thieves all over again before we can go after him. And that's Nasty's greatest flaw. As a final showdown, he isn't just boring, he's annoying too. Almost forgot about you guys. Stopping Nasty, the game ends as abruptly as it began, bookended by Spyro speaking to the camera crew and remarking that he completely forgot about them. I mean, at least we're aligned with our hero at the end of the story because we forgot about the camera crew as well. Despite the fact that Spyro 1 ends with all the gravitas of a dragonfly's fart, the game was still a fantastic platformer for its time. The foundations of a new favourite mascot are all here, cradled into this engaging, speedy little game, but if you presented this to me as an end of your project, I'd give it an A plus for effort and a B minus for quality. Insomniac revised a lot of the platforming staples of the era and ironed out some crinkles, but they missed some of the corners. Luckily for fans, the sequel would give the Purple Dragon a serious upgrade. <laughs> Go on vacation! Somewhere warm! Somewhere sunny! Dragon Shores, yeah! I haven't been there since we kicked Nasty Nork's butt! How about it, Sparks? You up for a vacation at the beach? Last one there's a Nork! Spyro 2 Ripto's Rage, or Gateway to Glimmer if you played it in the UK like me, saw all of the potential that Spyro 1 had and carved out a whole new world for platforming collectathons. It has a plot for a start. It's not exactly Ulysses, but it's a plot which puts it a mile ahead of its predecessor. Spyro is ready to take a break after going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Nasty Nork. Ripto's rage begins mere minutes after we've rescued all of the dragons, and just like a key worker, Spyro is ready to go on vacation after working his ass off for people who don't give a damn about him. Within the first 10 minutes of Spyro 2, we get the setup, context, and action needed to provide an invigorating opening. First, the setup. The poor guy just wants to go to Dragon Shores. He's done with quests and bad guys, but when he poops through the portal, he trips into a brand new adventure. Then the context. As Spyro lands in Avalar, we immediately meet the team with two capital T's. The Professor, Hunter, and Sexy Mr. Tumnus. These guys replace the dragons as our tutorializers, but also have a set of personality traits to define themselves from each other, even if they are a little one note. The professor's smart and blind, Hunter's a coward despite being a cheetah, and sexy Mr. Tumnus. 
<laughs> okay, 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 sorry, I'll stop now. Elora is the only one who understands what the f*** is going on. I've seen people criticise the Reignited trilogy for killing Spyro's attitude a little in his delivery, but in Ripto's rage, I find that Spyro is portrayed as punkish as he was in the originals. If we take the trilogy as a whole, Spyro 1 gives us a fresh-faced Spyro who's eager to prove himself, so he's not grown into his cynicism yet. In Spyro 2, he just wants to go on holiday, he's completely done with Avalar's problems. He's faced danger head-on before and found it exhausting, not exhilarating like he thought it would be. He's ready to tell the team to get lost. And then, Ripto shows up. Well, well. Someone forgot to invite me to the party. Were you trying to keep something from me? A dragon? You brought a dragon to Avalar? I hate dragons! Ripto's initial presentation tells you everything you need to know about our evil warlock. The fact he just appears to bully our characters like, just for the hell of it, shows him to be nasty and narcissistic in the extreme. The fact he's riding atop Gulp shows he's clearly insecure about his size, and his reaction to seeing Spyro shows that we are his worst nightmare. And he bothers Spyro so much that the little purple dragon decides to help these three nincompoops overthrow a dictator. I'm not saying that Spyro's character growth is the next great American novel, but he goes from helping his own kind to helping complete strangers. That's got to count for something. The story of Spyro is literally an underdog going up against a limp-dicked orange, sorry, wrong picture, knobend. The Reunited Trilogy's Ripto is one of the starkest differences in characterization to me. Toys for Bob have doubled down on his anger and his narcissism and minimised the drawling cockiness from the original game. In the PS1 version, Ripto's vowels were always drawn out. His tiny white on green eyes and his fat snout made him look more human, so a lot of his mannerisms came across as pantomime villain-esque rather than a truly evil warlock. It's one of the things which made Ripto such a menacing villain. Well, that and the fact he's the only villain in the trilogy to consistently interact with Spyro. In Spyro 1, Nasty Nork wasn't in the game enough. In Spyro 2, Insomniac gave us plenty of moments for Spyro and Ripto to trade verbal blows. But in the Reignited trilogy, the design has been completely overhauled. The ability to bring on more detail means that Ripto now has claws and sharp teeth. His eyes have been re-engineered to be more reptilian with the pupils like slits. He's legitimately horrible and the voice direction reinforces this. Reignited Ripto is more gravelly, he's quicker in his enunciations, he shouts like a lot, and as a result he's characterised as what he always was. A sad, strange little man and he has my pity. Once Ripto departs, we get to the action of the opening. Spyro 2's intro is slightly longer than the previous game, but we don't have long before the sequel slaps a sexy-ass new level on the table for us to explore. Glimmer fully tutorialises the enemy types, the movement and the combat that we've already seen in the previous game, but it also teaches us all about the new stuff Spyro 2 brings to the table. This is a more controlled opening than its predecessor. We don't get to see the home world until we've completed Glimmer, and as a result, the game feels more focused and invigorated. The first new thing to notice are the NPCs Spyro can encounter. They introduce us to the vibe of the level, and most importantly, they provide context as to what each world's story is. Glimmer is a world which mines gems, but it's been overrun by lizards looking to steal their treasure. Horikos is all about harvesting electricity, but the naughty gear grinders are running amok. In Idle Springs, magic has brought wooden carvings to life who are now trying to eat the sculptors. And over the course of your journey, every world you drop into will be in a similar state of anarchy, presumably caused by the destruction of Ripto's scepter, blasting chaotic magic across Avalar and blowing open long hidden cracks in these different societies. See, despite having a consistent aesthetic across all three games, astute players will notice that there are some small changes in Avalar. 
The metal and wooden chests are now gone, replaced instead by metal vases and woven baskets. Mechanically, they still behave the same, charge for metal, fire for wood, but it's a simple yet effective way of giving Avalar an otherworldliness. Insomniac had two options when designing an entirely new world. They could have changed the visual design of these levels, removing the pop aesthetic, or they could design new assets for Spyro to interact with, and these replacements are as good a shakeup as any. In Glimmer, we also meet the final member of the team, Moneybags. I always enjoyed how cartoonish she was in the original games, and the Reignited trilogy does the same thing here, using the character model of a bear to give his large size a sense of gluttony and greed. It plays at your most primal stereotype of a banker, but hey, this is Spyro. Having a money-grubbing banker that looks like a Monopoly Man but bear edition is so silly and memorable that people who haven't even played a Spyro game know who Moneybags is. Also in the Reignited trilogy, he reacts when you attack him. <laughs> Get to Moneybags. Completing Glimmer, Spyro gets a proper opportunity to talk to Elora. Spyro's gonna help us collect the talismans. I am? He is. Spyro, look, there's no way you can get to Dragon Shores right now. <gasps> there's no way we can get to Dragon Shores? I know that, Alora. Do you want to know why we can't go to Dragon Shores? Because you stuck me here! Stuart Copeland is back once again with a new soundtrack which feels much more definitive of each world. Whilst Spiral 1 had some real bops, the characterization of each of Spiral's worlds through sound is stronger than ever. Just take this small snippet of Idle Springs as an example. Just consider the instrumentation. The wet popping of bubbles can be heard rhythmically cutting through, and considering the tiki aesthetic of the world, and the fact that this is the first world where exploring underwater yields results, it brings about a sense of exploring a sunny, wet vista. Then the thin wooden drumsticks sound underneath, naturally linking to the wooden idols who are running rampant. Then let's compare it to Horikos. is crunchy, and almost sounds like heavy footprints squelching into soft mud, like the huge gear grinder stomping around this stormy, wet power plant. The two themes sound completely different, and immediately distinguish each level in your mind. The themes for the homeworlds are less focused on being catchy jams, and more focused on being ambient, sounding mystical and safe. Considering the homeworlds of Spyro 2 are all about exploration and relaxing before the next combat-laden level, the fact that Summer Forest sounds like this... ...means that we're immediately reminded each time we return home that here we are safe to take our time. Can you tell how much I love this game yet? But there's one major downgrade in Spiral 2's aesthetic in the Reignited trilogy. They have claws like this, and teeth like this, and they can spit fire like this. Toys for Bob, what the hell did you do to my boy Hunter? Ripto's visual and vocal overhaul I can forgive. It's a fresh new take on the character, doubling down on his monstrous qualities and minimizing some of the campiness. But Hunter? I like his visual design enough, I, I love that his bow and quiver are a constant staple in the new design because I'm a sucker for animals using man-made weapons, but the extra detail almost removes some of the lovable derpiness from him. His more expressive face makes some of the dumb guy jokes feel a little bit forced. With Spyro 1, we discussed how eyebrows were one of the main ways Spyro was given his intelligent stare. Hunter's lack of eyebrows in the PS1 version did the opposite. The lack of eyebrows almost felt purposeful, a way of highlighting Hunter's thick-headedness. And look, adding a set of eyebrows to Hunter, again, I can forgive, but the vocal performance just feels wrong somehow. In the original game, Hunter was arrogant and dumb. It often felt like he legitimately believed he could kick Ripto's ass if he got his hands on him, but at the last moment, he would cower away with his tail between his legs. Similar to Ripto, we've lost his drawl, and strange random emphasis on words. It made him sound sometimes like he was mocking us. 
Hiya, Spyro. Ripto smashed this bridge, so I guess you'll have to glide across it. Press X to jump, then press X again while you're still in the air to glide. See what I mean? It made defeating him in his various challenges so satisfying. In Summer Forest, he's just a tutorial on gliding, but because he sounds so patronizing, it makes the whole thing far more entertaining. In the Reignited trilogy, he just sounds like a tutorial. Speaking of Hunter, why does he make us do tasks to collect orbs? The whole team is meant to be working together to find these Hunter, you nit. Hunter isn't the only character which the Reignited Trilogy bastardizes, and we'll get to you, Bianca, but my bias for this game makes this one more egregious. Summer Forest ends with a boss fight which puts all of Spiral 1s to shame. I don't know who to thank in Insomniac for this mechanical upgrade, but someone somewhere is sipping on a cup of tea right now with the full knowledge that they are single-handedly responsible for taking Spyro's bosses out of the gutter and into some of my favourite platformer boss fights of all time. Dropping into the dungeon, we find Crush waiting for us. One of the neatest details about the Crush and Gulp fights is that Ripto sits in an Emperor's box in the background, cheering on his cronies. I remember being a kid and wondering if I could somehow scurry up to him to set him on fire, but alas, no. We're here to face off against the first of Ripto's henchmen. Ripto can wait. Crush has three simple attacks. He runs from magical plate to magical plate, souping up a cobbler coated attack for us to dodge, and Spyro needs to smoke him up the ass whenever he leaves the safety of these little platforms. There's huge amounts of telegraphing in between each attack. Not only do we get a visual cue for which spell is coming long before Crush makes his move, but there's also a long physical animation as well. Because Spyro's so small and Crush is so big, his tiny flame attacks can't hurt him, but they can cause his massive size to release a seismic wave which drops the ceiling on him for some serious damage. For such a simple platformer, a child playing this for the first time could feel like they've taken down a monster. Defeating Crush, Ripto throws an itty bitty tantrum and we get the first in a long line of priceless moments between Spyro and the Warlock. At Simpleton, the gulf will be more than a match for you! Bring it on, shorty! Go! Come here now! Destroy him and make sure it's painful! Go! Get me out of here! Spyro actively ribbing Ripto and picking on his biggest insecurity, his size, is clearly one of those moments players point to when they discuss how Spyro has an edge as a character. This guy is an all-powerful dictator, Spyro is a stranger in this land and barely understands how it works, but what he does know is this teeny titan needs to go down. On to Autumn Plains. <laughs> Going from Spyro 1 to Spyro 2 feels like it's a generation apart as far as game feel goes, even in the Reignited trilogy. There's a clear sense of iteration in how Spyro moves and in how the game structures its collectible system. The trifecta of movement, combat and collectibles remains intact, but the repeated inclusion of power-ups and upgrades to Spyro's moveset keeps the sequel feeling… juicy. Gross, I know. First, let's talk about Spyro's new moves. We immediately get access to his new hover ability at the end of Glides, adding an extra piece of grace to the standard platforming and allowing Insomniac to add a slight difficulty curve to some of Spyro 2's trickier level design. That question of, can I glide there, now has an extra facet to it. A player doesn't just need to judge whether a straight glide would carry them to a far off platform anymore, they now need to assess whether or not the hover will carry them just that little bit further. He can also swallow up rocks and bombs to fire at hard to reach enemies. I know this is more contextual than some people would like, for example in Zephyr you'd swallow up these magic beans, sorry, seeds, and plant them to grow beanstalks to jump on, but anybody who tells you that this is just a gimmick for some of the side quests is lying to you. Just look at Skelos Badlands. Here the enemies are made of fire, meaning our flame breath naturally doesn't work on them. This means that the player is forced to use one of Spyro's new skills to get through the entire level. By the time we take down Ripto and make it to Dragon Shores, Spyro feels like he's undergone a major upgrade in his abilities because of this. There are incremental additions to his moves, not just the big three which we purchase from Moneybags. 
Spyro 2 also introduces ice physics, and these I love a lot less. Spyro's turns are just not tight enough here, and the inability to leap off of the ground can make moments like the ice hockey game absolutely insufferable at points. Spyro's a dragon, his claws are sharp, he should be able to skid to a stop and launch himself off of the ground for some more satisfying traversal here. It's one of the sequel's few systems which feels… rushed. We also manually unlock swimming, climbing, and a head bash move. I have a complicated relationship with swimming. I couldn't be happier that water isn't like acid on Spyro's skin anymore, and it can feel so satisfying in large spaces like the ocean floor in Aquaria Towers, but the second you stick Spyro in a confined space or tunnel, the camera has an aneurysm. Look at this, or rather, don't look at it because sometimes it can be actively painful to look at, and this is supposed to be the brand spanking shiny new remake. I would have had no issues with Toys for Bob making these levels a little more expansive to stop the camera colliding with walls, ceilings, and the floor. On the other hand, despite its skittishness, it's so satisfying to immersively go from dashing around to essentially gliding through the air when you're underwater. I would spend hours in Aquaria Towers just running laps around the ocean floor. If Spyro can't just take to the skies when he's running around on land, it's a solid compromise to be able to simulate flight controls when you're swimming around in a wide open space. And because he's underwater, Spyro can't crash into walls like he does on land. Instead, he just slips off of them like an eel on crack. The climb is a fine new ability, but it suffers from the level design. You can only climb on ladders in the game, rather than carefully designed environments. If these ladders have been replaced by vines or branches instead, forcing the player to examine the world to figure out if this was a surface worth climbing on, it would increase the amount of aha moments that the player had whilst hunting for collectibles. Instead, Spyro sees a ladder, presses X, and pushes up on the analog stick to hop off the top. It's fundamentally no different than hopping over a wall. The head bash is very sexy to look at. Spyro's agile spin animation and the crunch of his horns makes him feel like he's gained a damage boost. It unlocks a new type of chest for him to break through, and in some of the later levels, like Metropolis, we can use this to activate elevators to carry us further. The greatest issue here is that Metropolis is really the only level where you need to use Head Bash as part of the core gameplay loop. Perhaps Spyro 3 will capitalise on this. Spoiler alert, it doesn't. We can use Head Bash to kill some of the more rigorous enemies too. The Rock Giants in Fracture Hills are a specific contextualised example, but there are also the metal bugs in Robotica Farms. These buckets of bolts need you to charge them to knock them on their back like a turtle, and then finish them off with a swift head bash to their soft underbellies. Speaking of enemy types, there's so much more variety in Ripto's rage than we saw in Spiral 1. Moving away from one specific race, the Norks, to a litter of different species helped to keep each world specifically memorable. We still need to charge small enemies and flame bigger ones, but their attacks are more varied. Sometimes this provides a creative challenge, and other times, well, let's look at the flying enemies in worlds like Zephyr. The big winged bastards will drop bombs on you from above, but they remain just out of sight. I like to imagine that Zephyr wasn't designed by Insomniac, but by like, I don't know, Mark Cerny's niece over a weekend and they didn't have the heart to tell her it was crap. It sticks out like a sore thumb when compared to the rest of Spyro's closely directed levels because of its crap side quests and frustrating slowness, and the addition of the vultures is just the icing on the cake here. If you're going to have flying enemies in a spiral level, then you need to have a projectile attack for him to use. For some reason, there aren't any rocks or bombs to spit at them in this world, and it's a major oversight. But Zephyr aside, there seems to be more of an awareness of the fact Spyro is a dragon in this game. Ice enemies can melt from his flame breath, but fire enemies are left untouched. These enemies generally have a longer reach and are quite a bit faster than they were before. Their telegraphing isn't nearly as laborious as it was in the first game, meaning you need to react quickly when going up against them. I think we've all been gobbled up and spat out enough times by the speedy hedge enemies in the Fractured Hills world just to send us into an existential rage. 
The fact the game now has NPCs also gives the enemies something to do. Those small moments we saw in Spiral 1 where Norks would knock into each other or Druids would attack each other are now always ongoing. In the previous game, there was a well-executed illusion of enemies being in the middle of something when Spiral would arrive. In Spiral 2, this isn't just an illusion, it's 100% fact. The bad guys don't just try to kill Spiral while dashing through the worlds either. They try to thwart you. In Breeze Harbor, your task is to light a handful of fires to power up the Breeze Builder's ship. The land blubbers inside the buckets will actively put out the fires when your back is turned if you don't wipe them out first. Again, they don't just wait for Spiral to cross their path. These henchmen have a goal, and they are intelligently designed to intercept you and continue working on that goal. Trolley, eh? Nami, but I got into trouble with your mum last night. Ha 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 ha! The collectibles are where the sequel far exceeds the original. The satisfying gem suck is still there, with Sparks being our guide, but we now collect orbs and talismans instead of dragons. Whilst we don't have bubbly creative designs or cutscenes anymore, the NPC which replaced the dragons makes that hurt a lot less. But what's really effective is the purpose given to these collectibles. No longer do we have the balloonist telling us that we need to collect a random number of things to cheer him up. Now, the collectathon economy has become important and finally makes sense. First of all, we have Moneybags, who finally gives a purpose to all of those gems we're collecting. Gems pay for our new moves, they unlock some worlds, they open bridges in levels, and because Moneybags is such a disgusting little Tory, the fact he invents arbitrary numbers is forgivable. It's 800 gems because this greedy f***er wants it to be 800 gems, just deal with it. Hello there Spyro, would you like to learn to swim underwater? I suppose I could teach you for <clears throat> a small fee. Okay, you don't have to learn to swim yet, but you won't get far in Avalar until you do. Hell, sometimes Muddybags even justifies the amount of gems he's asking for by providing context which links the various levels together as one large world in the player's mind. He wants to build a burger shack in Scaleless Badlands, or he wants to go on holiday in Idle Springs. You're personally funding his lavish lifestyle and getting a pittance in return. And honestly, I think it's kind of insomniac to teach kids about the hellscape that is capitalism. Collecting gems has some added variety in Spyro 2 as well. We still have our baskets, vases, rockets, and so on, but we also now need to use environmental abilities like turrets or power-ups to destroy the tougher chests. Spyro's new head bash move unlocks a special chest with a bullseye on the top. Dragon thieves have sadly been scrapped and been replaced with mystical magic jars, which you need to hunt down a few times so it gifts you the high amount of gems hidden within. These magic jars are… fine. I think they wouldn't be so disappointing if they weren't supposed to replace the fast-paced mocking dragon thieves which were so fun in the original. Farewell my friends, we hardly knew ye. As for orbs, these are given story-based reasons to be a necessity. They've been scattered by the fairies at the start of the game, so it feels like a race against time to nab them all before Ripto does. Every orb you collect is another knife in Ripto's back because it's directly hurting his goal of taking over Avalar. You need to collect the orbs because they're the magical power source for the portals. If you want to progress, if you want to collect more things, if you want to defeat Ripto, if you want to go to Dragon Shores, then you need to collect the orbs. The Reignited Trilogy does something kind of weird with the orbs though. In the original, they would bounce over to Spiral when gifted by an NPC, giving them a sense of weight and inherent value. In the Reignited Trilogy, they just vanish in a flash of light. It's a nitpick of mine, but I was kind of disappointed when my first orb didn't timidly hop over like a ping pong ball. Speaking of balls, Spyro 2 drops one with the talismans. In order to access each of the three boss fights, you need to complete every single world. Completing earns you a talisman, but there's no in-game explanation given for why talismans open the dungeons where Crush, Gulp, and Ripto await. I would be harsher on this if the talismans were more difficult to collect, I suppose. 
You get the talismans for progressing, they are barely a collectible, just a sign that you reached the end of the world. The worst thing about them is they're sexy and shiny, I mean just look at this ruby bomb, but they're unnecessary. Anyway, it's gotten to about that time where we've collected enough talismans to jump into our next boss fight, so let's go and see what Gulp has in store for us. Gulp? What is it, boy? Oh, the fairy. Here you go. Oh. You singed my cape! Dragon, you are really starting to get on my nerves! Say goodbye, flame breath! Gulp! <clears throat> Lunch time! Gulp is a tough boss, especially off the back of Crush. His health bar is twice the size of his pals, and he can heal himself. The arena is very similar to what we saw before, except I much prefer this one because of how dramatic the lighting and colour palette is. This isn't just in the Reignited trilogy either, there's something more royal and glamorous about this dungeon which makes the battle feel like high stakes. Autumn Plains is a large level, it's where you'll spend the majority of the game, with two speedways and eight worlds to discover. There's a lot of build up to gulp as far as pacing is concerned, so this boss battle feels dramatic, never mind the fact that he was just about to eat one of your friends. Your standard attacks won't cut it this time. With Crush, we could at least stun him with our flame attack, but with gulp, we have to use bombs, exploding barrels, and rockets to hurt him. Elora uses a pterodactyl from the Skelos Badlands to drop items down for us to make the most of, but she can also drop chickens, which lets you or Gulp heal. The whole battle is a really clever way of forcing the player to use the abilities they currently have, dashing, flaming and spitting, but with a new context, meaning your combat thinking needs to change to defeat Gulp. One issue with this fight though is in Gulp's missile attack. He blasts green missiles into the air, just a couple at first, but the more you hurt him and the angrier he gets, the faster he fires at you. These damn things feel like they're homing on Spyro sometimes. Look at this footage, he starts blasting a missile in the air, it's probably heading for my current location so I dive off to the left, but somehow the missile changes direction mid-flight and intercepts me in my new location. This was an issue with the original game, but in Reignited it feels more obtuse. Defeating Gulp knocks Ripto from his perch. Alora appears and thanks Spyro for all of his hard work, and tells him that she's off to help the Professor fix up a way to get us to Dragon Shores. As a cute way of endearing us to her, she and the fairies have prepared a deck chair and umbrella so Spyro can get a head start on his vacation. Cute. A bit disappointing that we didn't get to smoke Ripto personally, but fair enough. Gulp's fight was so strong that he felt like an endgame boss. You thought you had gotten rid of me. Well, I'm afraid not. I persuaded that fat bear money bags to sell me a few bombs. Off. <laughs> so, with Ripto back in the game, and worst of all, with a new powerful scepter, it falls to us to finish him off once and for all. Winter, notably being the most cold, depressing season of the year, is a natural setting for the game's final couple of hours. The skybox is a distinct dark blue, and the twinkling of the light sets off the colours to bring about a sense of… finality. Spiral 1's homeworlds were strung together by the flimsy continuity of having a handful of dragons in each one, but Avalar feels more like a whole land with a potential socio-economic policy in place. Hierarchies are established, wars are being waged, the architecture of summer forest, autumn plains and winter tundra are compatible with each other. The only thing which has changed are the colour palettes and environmental details to give us different shades of seasons. The world design once again is adhering to colour theory. The levels all feel more fleshed out in the sequel. Different races and species cross over with each other. Crossing into Zephyr, Spyro is charged with helping the land blubbers hold the line in a war against the Breeze Builders. You need to muster your way through a raging battle with explosions and turrets and bombs and soldiers. Okay, Spyro, looks like we got us a bit of a situation here. But when you head over to Breeze Harbor, the subtle setup and character designs reveal that this is a continuation of the plotline in Zephyr, except this time you're on the other side of the war. 
helping the breeze builders sending more troops into battle. This isn't the only example of this either. In Metropolis, we're seeing farm animals revolt against the industrialization of the robots. In Robotica Farms, this has taken one step further. It looks like Farmer John and his friends have done away with animals altogether and created robotic versions to take their place. But these rust buckets have revolted as well. The contextualization of these worlds, both in their design and in the narrative provided by the NPCs, makes the levels feel lived in once again. You're not just traveling through, you're actively aiding these communities with their specific problems. Ridiculous cutscenes appear when you enter a world for the first time, setting up that world's conflict. Whether it's the magicians accidentally embracing Ripto's chaos magic to summon these enemies in Cloud Temple, or the dinosaurs running rampant in Skelos Badlands and bothering the Neanderthals. <laughs> Once you save the world, we get a brief clip to show what's changed. It could be the spy kids being united and using their new power to burn some bad guys alive in Scorch, or the fawns in Magma Cove psychopathically murdering each other. Oh dear. The levels themselves are slightly less complex than Spiral 1, and it's the only criticism I can level against them. The interweaving island level design of the first game has given way to a large sandbox, with a clear-cut alley-esque main path and branching backyard roads which lead to side quests for us to complete. The levels have two types of structure. There's the first, like Skelos Badlands, where Spiral has the simple objective of surviving to the end of the level. The second is the more engaging. In some places we have to help the critters of each world complete a set of tasks to unlock the exit. This can range from lighting a few sets of fires in Breeze Harbor to guiding Shorty to his wee pal in Shady Oasis, where before the level was broken up by collecting a variety of dragons acting as intersectional checkpoints, now everything we do has narrative value. We are incrementally working towards a larger goal in each level. Melt the ice surrounding the Eskimos in Crystal Glacier so they can help us get to their shaman. Flood each room in Aquaria Towers to hydrate the seahorses, and so on. As a result, each unique task that Spyro has to do keeps each level feeling distinctive. You remember these worlds because of the specific actions you had to take to help out the residents. There are more hazards in Spyro's levels as well. Pools of acid and fire for us to watch out for. Whilst there are less bottomless pits and chasms for Spyro to fall into, there's always a sticky liquid which can wipe us out if we're not careful. Spyro is still a fast game in the sequel, don't get me wrong, but the player needs to pay more attention to where they're going. It's not just lethal hazards either. Spyro 2 has more paraphernalia and random objects littering the level in an effort to add further detail. These aren't egregious by any count, but considering the previous game had such a strong emphasis on interrupted traversal, bumping into a cactus in Skelos Badlands for the fifth time can get… pretty frustrating. Spyro 2 also adopts some backtracking. For example, when you enter Idle Springs for the first time, it's likely you'll see some gems winking at you from the bottom of the lake, but if you haven't unlocked the swim ability yet, you won't be able to dive underground to get them. The same goes for climbing and head bashing. You don't need to do this backtracking to complete the story, but in order to 100% complete the game, or gain access to Dragon Shores, you need to revisit some old locations with your new movesets. Now look, I've seen Exo Paradigm Gamers videos and I'll link them below because they are a fantastically deep exploration of the trilogy, but I kinda disagree with his frustrations regarding Spyro 2's backtracking. And it's a psychological reason why. If you're going for the 100%, you need to backtrack. If you're going for the 100%, you won't just need to get orbs, but gems as well. And the likelihood of a first-time player collecting all of the gems in each level the first time through is pretty damn low. So giving the player a reason to revisit these worlds after you've gained a new ability means you're less frustrated when you have to go back to hunt for gems. In Spiral 1, returning to a world to sniff out an enemy I'd forgotten to kill or a random green gem hidden in the grass felt kinda laborious. But in Spiral 2, I at least know when I'm returning that there's going to be a side quest or unexplored area waiting for me. 
Speaking of the side quests, not all are created equal. A small handful of them completely drop the ball. The flight levels have a secret area where Hunter will wait for you, often with a vehicle. Take Canyon Speedway. This doesn't relate to flying, or breathing fire, or gliding, or jumping, or any of Spyro's natural moves. Instead, it's just an on-rail shooter to pop some balloons. Then there's Fractured Hills with the Alchemist mission. You pop by, help the Alchemist get past the Rock Ogre so that we can free Hunter's feet from stone. This mission is already tedious because of the AI pathing, but after all of it, Hunter then tells you to come back once you've got the head bash move. No problem, we buy the skill off money bags and head back, not different from any of the others. Escort me past those earth shapers. Wait, why are we- we have to do this again? This mission is constantly at the bottom of Spyro's side objectives, and for good reason. There's backtracking, and then there's backtracking, and replaying focused content like this is just frustrating padding. The Reignited Trilogy had a missed opportunity to fix stuff like this, but Toys for Bob's labour of love extended to even the most ridiculous of design choices. But quests like these are very much in the minority. Most of these provide a new sense of variety to Spyro's gameplay, which is still consistent with the core mechanics. Racing through a level, it's likely you'll come across a power-up gate, which will let you fly, or have an extra powerful flame breath, and these are often here so you can complete the side quests in familiar but fresh ways. The gameplay generally remains the same, but the objective and game think change. For example, in Metropolis, you find the inventor droid at the end of the level. She explains that the sheep are invading in spaceships, so we need to defend the city. Seems like fun, let's get into dogfighting. Jumping through the gate will give Spyro the ability to fly and shoot fireballs from his mouth, meaning he's functionally no different from a fighter jet, but it's still in line with controls that we've seen previously in the flight levels. It's also absolutely ingenious, oh, it's, it's, it's poetic as being canonically the last side mission you'll do before going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Ripto and it fully tutorializes the controls you'll need for the final phase of his boss fight. With that in mind, let's get to Ripto. Hey shorty, maybe I can help. What? You again? Yep. If you want to test that power crystal, why don't you try it on me? I'll stand still, I promise. Hmm, I like that idea. Dragon, you've just sealed your fate. Ripto is, to date, the best boss in a mascot platformer, no exception. He's been such a devious piece of shit that finally getting our claws on him is satisfying on an unparalleled level. This isn't just a straight up battle though, at least in the first two phases. Orbs get dropped into the arena and you have to race Ripto to collect three and then use your power up against him. His and your moves change dependent on which colour of orbs you're able to collect. But Ripto has the upper hand in the sense that he can hurt us even without collecting all of the orbs. We can't do damage in our standard state, but setting fire to his ass slows him down if he gets too close to one of these shiny power-ups. In phase 2, he summons Gulp, which proves once and for all by the way that Ripto had a favourite. He always treated Crush like the child he never wanted, but Gulp's death really broke his heart. The plan here remains the same. We collect red orbs for firepower, blue orbs for supercharge, and green orbs for a slow grenade launcher attack. This one's not as good as the others. Phase 3 takes things into the sky. Ripto, being a dinosaur, summons a metallic pterodactyl and takes to the skies over a boiling lake of molten lava, and we need to follow him. He weaves in and out of a variety of turrets, blasting spells our way, and it's at about this time that the player will realise that the entire battle has been thematically relevant to the gameplay, collectible and magical motifs of the entire story so far. The trifecta of gameplay, movement and collecting is fully realised in Ripto's boss fight, just like it was to a lesser so with Gulps. Defeating Ripto, he's swallowed up by the lava, what a way to go, a fittingly dramatic end for the series' most overly dramatic villain. The team all celebrate, and best of all, Moneybags returns all of the gems to us that we nabbed from him earlier. I don't think we could ever thank you enough, Spyro. 
I suppose you have to go now? Yeah, I'd better. They'll be missing me in the Dragon Worlds, and I've still got a vacation to take. I need it more than ever now. A climactic end to a fitting sequel, and the player is rewarded for their ingenuity with a ridiculous romp around Dragon Shores once they've collected enough orbs to pay their way in. We've made some new friends, saved a kingdom from the clutches of an orange dictator, and finally earned our vacation. Again. The cohesive variety is what made Spyro 2 such a joy to play. It had a hateable baddie, memorable worlds, and gameplay which felt different enough to be an upgrade from the original, but similar enough that you never lost the speed and momentum of playing as our favourite, fiery little dragon. And then a year later, Insomniac released Year of the Dragon. I remember hearing somewhere that Insomniac described developing Year of the Dragon as scraping the bottom of the barrel for ideas. I haven't been able to find a source for that quote, so it might just be hearsay, but regardless, it sums up my feelings about Spyro 3 pretty succinctly. A common theme in all great trilogies is that the second story is often the best. The Dark Knight, The Two Towers, The Empire Strikes Back, Spider-Man 2. It's not a hard and fast rule, but with the Spyro Trilogy, I think it stands. If you like the third game best, I'm willing to stake some money on the fact that this was your first Spyro game. It's not bad by any stretch of the imagination. Spyro Year of the Dragon is... good, yeah, grand, fine. See, that Goodfellas discussion at the start of this video wasn't all for nothing. So, let's look at what Year of the Dragon is good at and what it's just fine at. Major shout out to my girlfriend for collecting all the footage. She loves this game so as well as my own playthrough, I wanted to see what the experience looked like through her eyes. Sorry in advance for ruining your childhood, and if you want to see more of her, check out my video where I make her play Dark Souls. Let's begin. Huh? Get her! Stop her! The conceit of Spyro 3 is that rather than us needing to collect dragons who have been turned to crystal, we need to find all of the dragon eggs. We are back once again to Spyro giving pivotal plot details like where the eggs come from in the game's manual. Apparently the fairies just bring the eggs every year during the Year of the Dragon Festival, but <laughs> nah, we both know what's really going on here. Despite what some Redditors will have you think, the dragons are not shagging fairies and birthing dragon eggs from that. At least, I hope not. I choose to believe that all of the dragons are intersex. It makes much more sense, right? We only saved male dragons in Spiral 1, so I reckon it's more sensible to assume that they're like snails. They're intersex. See, when a daddy snail loves a mummy snail very much, they both produce sperm and carry eggs. It seems that Hunter has gone to live with new BFF Spyro in the world of dragons, hibernating with his big scaly friends in peace after Ripto's murder at the end of the previous game. A mysterious hooded figure paps her head out and with an infiltration team of weird, rhino looking buggers, swiftly steals all of the dragon eggs and vanishes down a burrow to the Forgotten Realms, a mysterious new land which exists on the other side of the world. Spyro 3 separates itself from the previous two games by introducing a somewhat complex lore in the Forgotten Realms. There's a shallow mystery of what happened to the dragons who once lived here, and it's eked out during Spyro's journey until the sorceress's villainous plot is revealed. We managed to capture the eggs, your highness. Every last one. Excellent. Maybe you will amount to something after all. And yeah, let's talk about the sorceress. The idea behind her is really interesting. She's the most psychopathic of Spyro's villains by far. She's a vain, genocidal maniac. Her first few seconds on screen sit her down in a golden throne in a large, regal chamber with dragon eggs built into the walls. Her loose-fitting crown is a cartoonish but no less realised way of showing us that she's clearly not the rightful ruler of the Forgotten Realms, likely an imposter on the throne. The detail in the Reignited trilogy does a lot more for her characterization with the detailed painted nails and rings, but even for the time in the PS1 version, Insomniac purposefully gave her a deep shade of lipstick to give us an indication of what she's all about. She's a diva. Her first line of dialogue to Bianca is, 
Excellent, maybe you'll amount to something after all. A backhanded compliment, which is negging, it shows how emotionally abusive she is of even her most trusted lackey. This is a solid, compelling setup. But there are two major issues here. First of all, the player has already seen a villain waging a personal war against the dragons before. As far as gameplay is concerned, this is a retread of the nasty Nork plot. Someone's got beef with the dragons, the dragons are incapacitated, Spyro needs to go and rescue some dragons. I know they're eggs this time, but baby dragons are still dragons. And don't tell me this is forgivable because it's a kid's platformer. Spyro 3 is the first game in the series to introduce an arc for a character. If the story is complex enough to give us an empathetic antagonist in Bianca, it can be complex enough to design a new conceit for why Spyro needs to... Well, collect the things. The second is in the sorceress herself. She's close to Nasty Nork in her personal relationship with the player, with Spyro. The sorceress doesn't say two words to Spyro during the entire game, which is a damn shame because she's so much fun when she's bullying her minions that all it would have taken was one scene with Spyro and the sorceress having a powwow to build her up to a greater height. Year of the Dragon gives us our sassiest version of Spyro yet. He's officially grown from the naive underdog to the sarcastic hero to the snarky badass over the course of the trilogy. So it's a shame Insomniac didn't think it would be worthwhile writing up a scene where there's at least a brief battle of wits between the dragon and the dinosaur. As a result, we end up not really caring about what the sorceress is up to. We care about Bianca. Which helpfully brings us to the official beginning of the game. Of rescuing the eggs, huh? <laughs> How sad. Look here, dragon. If you know what's good for you, you'll turn around and crawl back into that hole you came through. There are numerous points where Bianca appears, set off by that gorgeous rainbow magic effect. She clicks her tongue at us and tells us to back off. Moments like these set Bianca up as the baddie we develop a relationship with. She's the baddie we want to take down. She undermines our prowess. Like, who do you think you are, Bianca? I'm Spyro the f***ing dragon. I smoked Nasty Nork and melted Ripto in lava. You don't know what you're getting yourself into, lassie. As a result, when we see scenes where the sorceress is ripping into Bianca, calling her stupid and weak, we just shrug our shoulders. Or worse, we begin to like the sorceress a little bit. I mean, at least she's funny, and it's satisfying to see her knock Bianca down a peg or two after Bianca just did the same thing to us. Oh my god, I don't know if you could tell, but I've been waiting to get that rant off my chest. I'll give the game this much. The production value and the cutscenes are the greatest we've seen yet. There's a level of polish to the overall presentation of Spyro 3, and that comes through even in the Reignited trilogy. Heck, even the levels are more detailed, with a variety of flowers and plants to give each space a sense of natural growth. Whilst Insomniac still have an overall focus on colour theory, there's more nuance and subtlety which makes the worlds feel more lifelike. However, I would argue that this hasn't been balanced enough to always be a good thing. Take Sunrise Spring. So the third game drops you off in this hub world in a similar way that Spiral 1 does. You're going to start noticing a trend while I talk about this game. There are more similarities to Spyro's first adventure than you might think. Where Spyro 2 used seasons to separate the hub worlds, meaning each world had a distinct mood and tone to it, green, orange, blue, the worlds in Year of the Dragon focus on times of day. We have Sunrise Spring, Midday Gardens, Evening Lake, and Midnight Mountain. Now, with a name like Sunrise Spring, I would imagine our colour palette to focus on some contrasting yellows, greens and blues to present a crisp morning. But instead we get green grass, green leaves, and some blue water. That consistent third colour just seems to be missing. The layout of the hub world also appears much more narrow and alley-like compared to the open box the Ripto's Rage gave us. The second hub world, Midday Gardens, is simply too similar to Sunrise Spring in its colour palette and overall presentation. Sunrise Spring feels like an area within Midday Gardens, rather than a different world altogether that you'd need to travel to via hot air balloon. Again, we have green grass, blue water, green leaves. There also doesn't seem to be a purpose for these hub worlds to exist either. In Avalar, our three worlds seem to be the three most important locations. Each had a castle or manor of some sort, like an outpost where the world's council could keep an eye on the various levels. In the Forgotten Realms, there just seem to be… places. 
Why were portals built in Sunrise Springs specifically? What value did this place have to the Forgotten Realms long ago? The world design doesn't tell us. Now, it's worth noting that Year of the Dragon spits in the face of its predecessor's opening level. We don't get to start the adventure in a focused level created with specific purposes of teaching us Spyro's new systems and tutorialising the mechanics. Instead, Spyro 3 drops the player into Sunrise Spring and just says, Go. While Spyro 1 still should be commended for how it guided the player whilst still maintaining freedom at the time, Ripto's Rage elevated this. It got the tutorial out of the way early so the player could start learning new abilities and experiment. You're going to hear criticisms like these a lot in this section, that Spyro 3 takes Spyro 1 systems and iterates on them slightly. The reason why it disappointed me so much and why I think it merits critique is simply because Spyro 2 did all of this better. We don't look at Super Mario Odyssey and say, well, it's better than Super Mario 64, do we? We gauge its place in a series on how it improves on the design philosophy of the game that came before. Year of the Dragon repeats a lot of the great foundations that Spyro 1 had, especially in its opening moments, but it seems to forget the leaps and bounds which made Spyro 2 so special to its players. In fact, a perfect example of this would be, in all things, the chests. In Spyro 2, Insomniac used brand new curvaceous designs for the gem containers to make Avalar seem otherworldly in comparison to the world of dragons. In Spyro 3, they used the same containers. Why are Avalar's vases and baskets in the Forgotten Realms? They are two completely different lands. The Avalar baskets have as much place in the Forgotten Realms as Crash Bandicoot's boxes do. I don't know if this was down to laziness or just a basic oversight on the developer's part, but the inclusion of these things are indicative of a lot of the silly problems with Year of the Dragon which add up to an overall more underwhelming experience. The cutscenes, framing each of the worlds, have now been scrapped as well. No longer do we get an inside look at the conflict going on in each level before appearing just to sort it out for them. No longer do we get a little epilogue for each level, showing how our intervention has helped the residents. It makes the NPCs of each world just that bit more forgettable as a result. I can rattle off every race and species of Spyro 2 to you without drawing breath, but if someone were to ask me what the hell this thing is, I'd come up short. Yuck. But credit where credit's due. In Spyro 3, each portal is now contextualised. Lost Fleet is built into the side of a sunken ship. The seashell shore is inside a giant shell. It's a small detail, but it's appreciative all the same, making each entrance to a world feel older somehow, less homogenised in their individualism than the same standard portals we saw for two games. But again, the portal design can be creative and funky, but if I don't care about what's going on when I arrive in each world, what's the point? Because I don't care about the NPCs in Spyro 3. They don't have unique stories going on like the land blubbers and breeze builders did with their intersectioning stories. We don't learn why each world exists in the Forgotten Realms. We don't learn what they contribute to a greater whole. Here's a world with some seals. Have fun. Here's a world with some lines. Have fun. Bloody panda. I'm sorry. That was the ugliest chicken I've ever seen. Actually, okay, okay, that one's pretty fun. But the issue is that the core conflict in 90% of these levels isn't unique. It's almost always, Spyro, Rhinox are here, kill them! Now, there are intricate exceptions to this. For example, there's Enchanted Towers, where the sorceress ordered they build a great brass statue of her and you need to destroy it. It comprehensively ties to the game's overall battle against the sorceress, and it provides context as to what this world brings to the party. It's full of artists, but it feels like the whole game is determined just to litter every world with Rhinox, which I'll get to in combat, so any potentially unique narrative of each level has been cast aside in favour of horny bastards are running rampant, stop them. This brings us on to level design. I'm shaking up the formula a tad for the third game, because there's a lot to discuss when we get into the mechanics. Spyro 3's levels at a core base are as fun to navigate as they were in Spyro 2 or even Spyro 1. They still sprawl, but these levels seem less concerned with letting us speed about. There are a lot of sharp turns and tight corridors, and some of the enemy placement can be absolutely ridiculous at times. Just look at Haunted Tomb. How is any player realistically able to land on this platform from a far-off glide and take out this magma statue without taking a hit? 
there's less of a sandbox design in the later worlds. Sure, there's Sunnyside Villa at the start, which gives the player wide rectangles to run around in, but the majority of these worlds are less like a huge splat, and more like squiggly lines which overlap with each other. Just look at Molten Crater for a direct example of this. You follow a streamlined tunnel complex with a couple of wider areas which loops back in on itself. Or Dino Mines, where Spyro needs to navigate a western town battling gunslingers. But the options for freedom and creativity are limited. You're just marching up the street and around the back of a couple of buildings, which is a shame. Generally, verticality seems to no longer be the priority. Paraphernalia is more common as well. Insomniac saw the frustrating cacti in Skeelos Badlands and decided to double down on this. In Bamboo Terrace, tiny bamboo stalks stick out to the ground, so between these, the tiny unnecessary steps to hop up and the tight corners, a lot of Spyro's gameplay involves him bumping into things. On that note, the majority of Spyro 3's levels seem to be in continuation of levels we've seen before, at least on an aesthetic level. Seashell Shore is just Sunny Beach. Molten Crater is just Magma Cove, but more boring. Charmed Ridge is just Lofty Castle. Icy Peak is just Frozen Altars, which is just Crystal Glacier from Spyro 2. The levels seem to have been purposefully designed to focus attention to Spyro's more janky mechanics. There's an entire hub world, Evening Lake, which is almost entirely underwater, so your respite from combat is given over to the janky camera underwater again. There are two massive ice levels, and Spyro still can't jump, so it's likely a player will be frustrated by the forced slowness they experience on the ice. Once you reach the end of a level, you often have a new perspective which opens up to a few can I glide there moments, which is majorly welcome after the tunneled journey you follow to get there, but these moments are clearly less focused on uncovering hidden gems or eggs, and more focused on letting Spyro glide over to a portal which drops us into a side mission. And let's talk about that. In Spiral 1, finding mini quests and side activities was as fluid as finding an egg thief that just rampaged about the world. Spiral 2 littered its worlds with NPCs waiting for you to fill you in on an extra collectible to look out for in the world or a, a nearby power up to use almost immediately. Spiral 3's side missions are hidden behind portals and loading screens. These are less itchy in the Reignited Trilogy because of the lightning fast loading times, but gating side quests and eggs behind portals, rather than making them interconnected to the world, gamifies each world to the extreme. You're reminded of the fact you're playing a game more in Spiral 3 than any of the others, and it's all due to the side quests. I understand that this was likely to preserve some of the PS1's processing power because the worlds in Spyro 3 are so big, but that's not an excuse. Some of these worlds are simply too big, and many of the side quests are crap. Crapper even than some of Spyro 2's most egregious moments. If your immersion has been sacrificed so that I can jump on mushrooms as Sheila the f***ing kangaroo, or get stuck in yet another vehicle, then the game needs to be reworked from the ground up. And yes, you heard me rightly, the side missions are crap, at least for the most part. Some of them give us mini-bosses to tackle, like Sleepyhead and Spooky Swamp. These are a cute way of making Spyro feel more like a combatant than he did in previous games. But so many of these mean you're losing control of Spyro in favour of one of the side characters, or worst yet, a vehicle. There are 150 eggs to collect, right? Four you collect as Sparks, four as Hunter, seven as Agent Nine, seven as Sergeant Bird, seven as Sheila, and seven as Bentley. That's 36 eggs you collect without Spyro in the room. Then, on top of all of that, there are the vehicles. By the time you put the game down, Spyro will have been in a tank, on a hovercraft, in a submarine, a boat, a manta ray, a skateboard, a UFO for Pete's sake, Spyro is a flying dragon, are we just forgetting that just a year earlier he was flying about blasting sheep out of the sky with a power up? He doesn't need to be in a UFO. The flying levels now have two versions, the classic collectathon and the races, and even these once reliable side activities have been bastardized. For a start, there's Sparks, who now starts each level by <laughs> chatting to Spyro. 
That is nails on a chalkboard stuff that. Then there's what they've done to the collectathon sections, where once before we would need to collect objects to give Spyro a little more time, now Spyro just has one set ticking clock. It doesn't matter how many protesting cows you've collected, that clock just keeps ticking down. I know you're probably going to be sitting there thinking I'm nitpicking, but this is analogous with the overall issue with how Spyro 3 plays. The symbiosis between movement and collecting is gone. Setting fire to a plane no longer gives us an immediate kinetic sense of satisfaction. The second version of the flying levels are now straightforward races. On the surface level, these are fine, but they are ridiculously difficult. Yes, yes, I know, get good, etc, etc, but the plane in first place always has a flawless three laps, and the only way to beat it is by charging through every single shortcut or speed boost to overtake him. This isn't a race using RNG to give a sense of realism. If you miss any of the shortcuts or speed boosts, you might as well just start over. The only way to win these races is through a flawless run. One mistake will ruin any chance. Just like my ears when Spark speaks, we're beginning to bleed into talking about mechanics and gameplay rather than level and mission design, so let's move on to the second half of Year of the Dragon. Off to Evening Lake. <laughs> Spyro Year of the Dragon took a lot from other PlayStation Classic games. Tomb Raider, Tony Hawk, even a side-scrolling section from Crash Bandicoot was slapped into Spyro's adventure all hodgepodge-like. This was done in the name of Variety. Now, when I discussed the level of variety we saw in Spyro 1 and Spyro 2, I discussed it as a good thing, and there it absolutely is. Spyro 2 has a wide variety of enemies, races, species, and tasks to complete. It would generally involve variety in Spyro's goal, but not his gameplay, like saving the cavemen and skills bad lads with your flame breath, or spitting seeds to help with platforming. Sure, in a couple of rare areas it would involve new gameplay, like trouble with the trolley in Breeze Harbour, but these were in the minority. Year of the Dragon says f*** it to all that, now you're skateboarding. Now you're dogfighting, now you're a penguin, now you're a yeti, and you're boxing. It's variety, 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 variety! And that's the issue with Year of the Dragon. The most grievous issue, at least. The issue that's at the very heart of Spyro 3's design, which still makes it a fun game, sure, but a disappointing sequel to Ripto's Rage. Spyro 2 has variety. Spyro 3 has V-A-R-I-E-T-Y. Vehicles and random interactions, everyone's tired, yeet. But you know what, I could probably defend these V-A-R-I-E-T-Y minigames if they were fun, but not enough time has been given to them. We talked about the flying races already, but the actual mechanics of these races seem kinda jank as well. Maybe it's just the Reignited Trilogy, but racing in Spyro on the whole needs work. In Lost Fleet, it's way too easy to overshoot when racing on the skateboard, meaning you'll end up in a bottomless pit. The turns aren't tight like when Spyro is charging around on land. The same can be said for a lot of these vehicles. Sure, let's stick Spyro in a little boat for a boss fight against Bluto the Rhinoc, but if the boat controls are as finicky as Spyro is on ice, just floating all over the shop, the entertainment factor is severely diminished. And it feels like these controls are copy-pasted into the submarines as well. Just give Spyro a power-up gate so we're still controlling him. I don't need him to be in a submarine. Some of the vehicles even slow us down. Just look at the hovercraft in Haunted Tomb. This is a nightmare to control. It's crawling along at a snail's pace, and you simply are not fast enough to dodge the bombs hurtling towards you. But the enemy hovercrafts are as nimble as a skeleton's fingers. Skateboarding was fun for the time, but again, this isn't Spyro. This is Spyro Team Racing. I get it, Insomniac. You were getting sick of Spyro and you were beginning to think about Ratchet and Clank, but replacing interesting abilities with vehicles aren't enough to keep me entertained. Hell, Spyro even jumps on vehicles to travel between hub worlds, be it a hot air balloon or a rocket. It's vehicles as far as the eye can see. 
A lot of Spyro 3 seems determined to slow you down. You'll spend time jogging around rather than dashing like before. You have to jump inside towers to melt ice, or worse yet, turrets to break ice. I don't need these turrets. I have a head bash move which Spyro has carried over from Spyro 2. I can supercharge using the super gates. Get out of here with your turrets, icy peak and frozen altars. I'm Spyro the mother fudging dragon. <sighs> And another thing, Spyro's head bash ability is next to useless in Spyro 3. In Ripto's Rage, we were introduced to enemies who needed to be knocked on their back and finished off with a head bash, but Spyro 2 completely forgets about this. There are like two chests with the bullseye on them, and other than that, Spyro might as well not have his head bash. Climbing is used more than ever, but Insomniac haven't learned from their mistakes in Spyro 2. They're still standard ladders which stick out from the world rather than contextualised branches or vines. Enemies feel like a natural extension of Spyro 1 rather than Spyro 2's wide array of creatures. The later levels fix this up a tad with like giant scorpions and things, but for the majority of your time playing as Spyro, you'll be fighting reskinned Norks in the form of Rhinox. There are some really fun little additions like the ahem, ghosts in Lost Fleet where they're just two Rhinox in a sheet, but there are only so many large Rhinox with a club that I can face off against before I feel like I'm just battling the Norks all over again. Meat Club Rhinox, Seashell Rhinox, Pickaxe Rhinox. Rebranding the Rhinox for each world was cute back in Spiral 1 when they were Norks, but it's a whole step back from the gear grinders or elephant snails of the last game. There are other creatures, but in an attempt to bridge the gap between the individual realms and the overall story of the sorceress, Year of the Dragon loses a lot of the individual, memorable, magical enemies which made Ripto's rage so invigorating. Let's take a break, grab a cup of tea, come back when you're ready, and we'll look at the collectibles. Some bearer sold us a laser defense system to protect us from Rhinox, but with these flippers, I can't even turn it on. You're back. Good. Okay. Let's talk about collecting the things. So Spyro 3 has two collectibles, gems and eggs. I think simplifying the collectathon from Ripto's Rage was a great idea. We didn't need the talismans in 2, so we definitely don't need them in 3. Moneybags is back in full force to steal all of our gems, except this time Barris Johnson... Get it? Barris Johnson? Okay, fine. Well, Barris Johnson over here is working directly for the game's antagonist. He's presented as more gleeful and sinister in his greed in this game, and in a list of things that Year of the Dragon does right, this is top of the list. Moneybags is the most hateable character in the series, purely because of how he's portrayed in the Forgotten Realms. No longer is he just capitalising on the game's conflict, now he's directly working for the sorceress by guarding some of the eggs, locking doors on us, and trapping some of the side characters in cages. There's a really stark growth in how much Moneybags demands from you by the time you reach Midnight Mountain. If a player hasn't been paying attention to how they're spending gems, there's a good chance that they won't have enough to progress in some of the later sections. But Insomniac, taking some feedback from Ripto's Rage, made the effort to include numerous moments where our team of characters swiftly kick Moneybags' ass. Nothing is more iconic than the end of the game when we get to ram our long golden horns right up a sphincter to take back all the gems he's stolen from us. I can think of a couple of people I'd like to do that to, know what I'm saying? So, gems are good. Yeah, grand, fine. In fact, I go so far as to say that the way they're used in Spyro 3 is great, but the eggs... The eggs aren't as strong as the dragons in the first game, which is clearly what they're going for. For a start, the designs in the Reignited Trilogy are missing some of the magic and pizzazz which made them so exciting to find. But hell, they're baby dragons and there's frickin' 150 of them, there's only so much you can do. The real issue is in the names. Yes, I know, nitpicking again, but while I'm on a roll, let me have this. Michael isn't the name of a dragon. Jason isn't the name of a dragon. They're the names of the other Jonas Brothers who went missing in 2005. In fact, so many of these aren't suitable or interesting names for dragons. Where are the fantastical and mystical names from the first game? One of the most interesting names is Cerny, and that's just an easter egg for executive producer Mark Cerny of Knack fame. Remember Knack? 
Yeah. The eggs aren't hidden behind laborious V-A-R-I-E-T-Y side missions, they're just sitting in random locations, like at the bottom of a lake, or sitting on a nearby ledge. It felt like Insomniac decided there would be 150 of these in the game, and then had to find places to stick them, rather than sculpting specific, interesting ways to uncover them like the orbs in the last game. But the biggest issue with the eggs is how they gate off the progression of the journey. See, because the Forgotten Realms are losing all of their magic, the gimmick of Spyro 3 is that you need to collect enough dragon eggs to activate the portals to each world. As for narrative, this is absolutely fine. I can't rip into the game for this because it gives the dragons a purpose in the game. But unfortunately, this is one of those moments where the game sacrifices game feel for the story. A rarity in most platformers, but when it happens, you can feel the waves crash through each beat of the gameplay. Locking off each world is just arbitrary. You don't require specific power-ups like the climb ability in Spyro 2 to complete a level. If every single world was open from the get-go, you could freely explore them to your heart's content. Instead, requiring a certain number of eggs to access each world funnels you into a linear path of world progression. Do Sunnyside Vista to get so many eggs, then do Cloud Spires, then Seashell Shore, and so on. It disrupts the freedom a player has over how they can cultivate Spyro's journey. And then, of course, there's the side characters. Ted Price has gone on the record as saying that they didn't want to burden Spyro with a host of new moves and abilities, so they decided to split it up into some side characters. We've got Sheila the Kangaroo, Sergeant Bird, Bentley the Yeti, and Agent Nine, a Lombax from the planet, or, I mean, uh, I mean, a monkey from the Professor's cruel and inhumane experimentation of animals. Seriously, we get it, Insomniac. You want to make Ratchet and Clank. We've already clarified that part of Spyro's joy is in his speed. Like another famous mascot I won't mention for fear of a copyright strike, cutting the speed out of his traversal removes a good chunk of the satisfaction we get from his gameplay. Every new character is as slow as a shite with legs. First, Sheila. Thanks again, Spyro. Now I have to find out what that nasty sorceress has done to my home while I was locked up. Sheila the Kangaroo has two attacks. She can either kick an enemy or ground stomp them. Her first world takes us through her assistance of the Billy Goats Gruff, who are German and wearing Lederhausen rather than, sure, whatever. That's just silly enough to work. We need to help her little friends get back into their homes after they were ransacked by the Rhinox. The crunch of her feet on a Rhinox skull is satisfying to listen to, but getting to a Rhinox feels like it's a long walk across a desert. Da thunk. Da thunk just hop, hop, hopping away to reach them. Her jump allows her to launch up and into the air, which is really fun, but she's too vertical. She shoots up in a straight line and can barely move forwards, backwards, or sideways while she's in the air. Too often, you'd think that launching Sheila upwards will carry you up and over to a platform just for the minimal in-air movement to keep you fixed in one place. Next, Sergeant Bird. Into the arm. So why didn't you use them to escape? Because, because I have limited ammo, and I wanted to conserve it for this. Spyro 3 would be better without any of these characters, but specifically, Sergeant Bird needs to be cut altogether. Bird, James Bird, is leading a military effort against the Rhinox, which at least presents a grander scale to the sorceress's plot, but playing as him can be physically painful. He can fly in the air by holding X, but his tiny arms inevitably make his flying so slow. If it was about realism, then I have two things to say about that. First, sticking a jetpack on his back to make his flying faster would be a major improvement, and second, this is a magical game about a teenage dragon. Realism was never a focus for Spyro. The camera for Bird is as epileptic as Spyro's underwater camera, and his one attack of sending rockets of Rhinox are just not good enough at homing. Third, Bentley. Why, you brazenly avaricious, duplicitous, larcenous ursine! Now hold on! Bentley being a yeti with both brains and brawn is a fun enough character design. Honestly, this guy would have been a fun moustache twirling villain or henchman for the sorceress. Using his club, he can lumber around, smashing chests that Spyro otherwise would need to light a rocket or use a turret to explode or even twirl enemies' attacks back at them, but outside of his first level where he helps his younger brother reclaim his home, the twirl mechanic is hardly ever used again. It feels underdeveloped, and with Bentley being the slowest character out of the four, he's a chore to play as. 
Again, I'm here for speed and complex platforming as Spiral. Bentley offers neither. On to Agent 9. Ooh, say, you ever see a bear dance? <laughs> uh, no? Well, it's your lucky day! Check this out. <laughs> Quite the dancer, isn't he? Not much stamina, though. Too bad I had a lot more ammo left. <laughs> oh my god, shut up, shut up, shut up! The best thing about Agent 9 is that we get to see the Professor again. Playing through his secret island base and reclaiming it from the Rhinox is, again, fun, but in quotation marks. And honestly, there's a lot to like in Agent 9 purely because it's clearly the side character Insomniac had the most fun with. He can run around and shoot his blaster, which ricochets off of walls to take down Rhinox, but ultimately playing as him is exactly what it says on the tin. He's a demo of Ratchet without the gadgets and acrobats, which is just making him boring. Last, but actually not least, there's Sparks. <laughs> oh, oh god, oh, I hate it. Sparks is bird's eye view bullet hell against smaller creepy crawlies. You unlock these after completing each hub world and need to play them in a sequence. He eats power-ups to get new shooting abilities, and completing each one gives him a wider range to pick up gems. It's a shame, then, that the game tells you none of this. I've 100%ed Year of the Dragon twice now, and I swear, I forget every time that this is even a thing, despite being so ridiculously useful over the course of the game. As far as minigames go, it's the character I don't actually mind playing as. The bullet hells are fun and pretty challenging, harking back to games much older than even the original Spyro the Dragon, and giving Sparks a little boost to his gem scoffing always feels like a bit of a reward in its own right. He even gets little bosses at the end of each mission to tackle. This is variety done right. Oh, Alright, we're getting to the end now. Hunter has been captured by the sorceress, and Bianca decides to break him out after learning our demonic dino intends to murder the baby dragons to make a spell which will turn her immortal. We need to collect 100 eggs, two-thirds of the collectibles in the game, which will force the player to churn through some of the vehicles and side character missions. Walking into the sorceress's arena though, we get nothing. No cutscene. No, you dratted dragon, I'll damage your doodle from the sorceress. Nothing like our final moments with Ripto. We just get her waiting on this ambiguous platform with Agent 9. Ah, oh, yeah, I forgot about this. We need to talk about the bosses. Year of the Dragon has four boss fights, one for each hub world. Whenever Spyro travels to the next world, a cutscene will play where the sorceress rants and raves and transforms a Rhinoch into a hideous monster with the sole purpose of taking us down. For a game which goes to such painful lengths to try to contextualise anything, I have no idea how Insomniac dropped the ball with the bosses. Where previously they would inhabit their own world, or better yet, be relaxing within the walls of a world's castle behind a sealed door, the bosses of Spyro just kind of exist on these platforms, waiting for us. Why is Spyro stopping off to meet Buzz? What does he know about this creature? This dungeon just seems to be in the middle of nowhere, but he intentionally goes out of his way to stop the transport on the way to the next world to fight him. Why? The arenas themselves are all exactly the same, with the exception of Scorch, who at least has walls and a roof to make it look like he's living in a cave. There's a pool of lava surrounding a platform, which is honestly more lethal than the bosses themselves, because often you'll charge right off the edge of it while trying to avoid the enemy's attacks. It seems that Insomniac took our compliments about Gulp and Ripto's fights to heart because every boss fight follows the same formula as those ones. Our relevant ally from each world drops items for us to swallow up and use against the enemy. In the case of Spike, he can use these power-ups against you. With Buzz, he jumps about like the wet toad that he is, causing ripples to stream out towards you. With Scorch, he flies in the air and sends minions in to fight on his behalf. The issue isn't that these boss fights are bad, they're good, yeah, grand, fine. But the reliance on our allies dropping things seems to be a greater slog in Spyro 3 than in Spyro 2. You'll be waiting, at times, a full 30 seconds for an item to drop so you can do something, and there are numerous gaps between an enemy's attacks, so it really will feel at points like you're just waiting for Sergeant Bird to get his act into gear and drop a goddamn power- all of this comes to a head in the Sorceress's boss fight, and honestly, it's so analogous with everything I find disappointing about the game that I could have just analysed that when assessing where Year of the Dragon stands. 
First, we need to wait for Agent 9 to drop stuff this time, rather than the natural conclusion of all the side characters chipping in and doing their bit. We race around while the sorceress blasts us with her scepter until a vehicle drops. There are three phases. First, you jump in a turret and shoot some cannonballs at her. Then, you jump in a tank and shoot some rockets at her. Then, the final phase. You jump into a hovercraft and blast some lasers at her. The fight lasts all of about five minutes. Or ten, if you're stuck waiting for Agent 9 to drop the damn vehicles, and then it's over. The vehicles are as disruptive and slow and finicky as they have been for the entire game, and it doesn't utilise any of Spyro's inherent abilities as a dragon, just the new forced ones from the minigames and side quests. It's a damn shame. Ah, but that's not even the true boss fight. In order to unlock that, you need to 100% complete the game. Every Sheila mission, every submarine mission, every Sparks mission, every Bentley mission, you get the idea. Collecting every egg and gem in the world unlocks the sorceress's final form. A UFO. Like, the ridiculousness of this fight is so synonymous with the sorceress that it's what she's riding on the box art. It's like mid-air dodgems with a gun on the front. You chase her about and shoot her down. I have nothing else to say about this boss fight. Honestly, I'm giving it as much time and effort as Insomniac did. The ending cutscene of the game ships Spyro off on a quick journey to each of his new allies, where he asks around about where Hunter is. It isn't until Agent 9 almost gives the game away that he grows suspicious. So now that you're done saving the world again, are you going to visit me in Avalon? Wait, Alora? Hey girl, how you doing? Where you been? We missed you! Even though the secret sorceress boss fight ends with Spyro back in the Dragon Realms, I've always preferred the original ending. Hunter and Bianca are happy, all of our friends have peace restored in their respective worlds, and Spyro gets to have a cute date night with his old flame. Year of the Dragon isn't a bad game. I know I've railed on it big time in this video, and I stand by every one of my criticisms. Spyro didn't get old by the third game, Insomniac just started to lose interest, and with a 9 month turnaround as has been rumoured, no wonder the product we got was just fine rather than achieving the great heights of Ripto's rage. I felt weirdly disappointed with it as a child, and revisiting it to figure out why I was so disappointed has been, well, honestly weirdly cathartic, so thanks for sticking around this far if you have. With rumours of a Spiral 4 in the horizon from Toys for Bob and speculations claiming that it'll be titled Hall of the Gods, taking Spiral from mythical world to mythical world, my closing thoughts are this. If tomorrow Spiral 4 came out and it was basically just Year of the Dragon again, I'd be disappointed but not annoyed. Spyro 3 is a fine game, but I'm sure while exploring the mechanics, level design and conceptualising each of the original games for new hardware, Toys for Bob probably had a favourite and I'm willing to bet that it was Spyro 2. Thanks for watching. This one took a while. If you like what you saw, consider checking out my Hollow Knight critique. Uh, this Wii channel's been growing quite a bit by my standards, and I'd love it if you could stick around. Comment below what your favourite Spyro game was, like and subscribe, and as always, take care.